Nigel on the phone there, and I'm going to now go across to Mr. Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer, to brief us on this ASR. Um, Nigel, could you go ahead and brief us, please, on the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number Six Regulations? Go ahead, Nigel, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations in Northern Ireland 2020 were made and brought into operation on the 28th of March. The need for the restrictions and requirements imposed by the regulations are required to be reviewed at least every 21 days, and the first review has to be carried out by the 18th of April. The committee will be aware that it's a requirement of the uh, regulations that as soon as the department considers that any of the restrictions or requirements set out in the regulations are no longer required uh, to prevent, protect against, control or provide a public health response to the incidence or spread of coronavirus in Northern Ireland, then they should be withdrawn. There have now been seven sets of amendment regulations made that give effect to the executive decisions on the continuing need for the restrictions and requirements. And as I advised um, when the committee considered the previous set of amendments, these proposals for change are brought forward and considered as part of an agreed executive decision-making framework that includes guiding principles, a risk-benefit uh, assessment model, a structured process for assessing and implementing, modifying or withdrawing specific restrictions and requirements, the decisions to introduce, withdraw or amend existing restrictions or requirements have been implemented either through public messaging, guidance, legislative change uh, involving amendments to the regulations, or in some cases a mixture of all three of these things. Today, the committee is considering the sixth set of amendment regulations, SR number 103, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment number six regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The executive considered a number of potential changes to the regulations in light of proposals received from a variety of departments, the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor, and changes in other jurisdictions. Ministers recognise that the success of the regulations come at a cost to individual citizens and to many aspects of normal day-to-day -day life. And with that in mind, and with regard to the latest information and advice relating to the progression of the pandemic, the Executive decided to make a number of changes. The Amendment No. 6 regulations were made on the 11th of June and were uh, commenced as follows. The amendments relating to childcare, retail and outdoor gatherings were commenced at 11 p.m. on Thursday the 11th of June. Home visits from 11 p.m. on Friday the 12th of June. And the amendments in relation to elite athletes and the reopening of the housing market were commenced at 11 p.m. on Sunday the 14th of June. So in summary then, the six main changes introduced by these amendments were to allow the general opening of the retail sector, to allow the reopening of the housing market, to permit bubble arrangements whereby a person living alone may visit and stay with one other household, to allow places of worship and community centres to provide daycare, to increase the maximum uh, number of people permitted at outdoor gatherings uh, from six to ten, and to allow elite athletes to train and allow operators of holiday accommodation to provide accommodation for elite athletes, coaches, and parents of elite athletes under the age of 18. Um, thank you for, for listening to the introduction. I'm, I'm happy to try and answer any questions that members may have. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Um, I, I suppose one of the things I was curious about was, is there any data at this stage in relation to what the what effect the various easements are having on the R number or the new case number or any of those other important metrics that that uh, that CMO and, and and the department and minister are looking at is there any impact on those well certainly I think the committee will will know that um, the the R number and the other key figures are under constant review and that the general trend is, is is downwards, which is, of course, is very good news. Um, I think it's safe to assume that the um, restrictions to date have have um, produced that improvement, or certainly contributed significantly, and that has allowed a certain amount of headroom for further uh, relaxations to be considered. Um, 
it's very difficult, as you would imagine, to be able to disentangle the impact of any particular um, uh, restriction or easement, uh, or indeed to do that collectively. Certainly when um, proposed new relaxations are being considered, there is an attempt to look uh, at, the, at uh, the overall impact that those relaxations as a collective bundle, if you like, may have. Um, but it is quite difficult, as you would imagine, after the fact to, to be able to associate any particular change with a, with a particular um, um, easement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go firstly to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then I'll check with our Leah on the phone, and then I have a few members in the room indicating. So, Pam. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Nigel, for your attendance once again. Um, I suppose just uh, to start off with saying that uh, obviously the public and um, I think us even as elected members can struggle to keep up with um, the regulations and the confusion that, that, that arises from them, and I'm thinking. Uh, as an example of uh, the fact that um, nail bars, um, hair salons, beauty salons uh, will be able to open from the 6th, um, but yet massage doesn't, when that quite often is included under um, beauty salons. Uh, so I wonder, is there any clarity um, on that, or is there what's the rationale for having those so specifically um, divided up um, amongst the reg uh, amongst the um, regulations. I think, I think that's a fair point. Um, moving at the pace that we're at, uh, and obviously different departments looking at different aspects of different sectors, um, has resulted, unfortunately, in some relaxations leading to uh, inconsistencies, and that's something that we're constantly trying to address. Um, the, the point that, that Pam made ha, has been picked up, I think, an earlier executive announcement related to that particular category of close contact services um, around nail bars and hair, hairdressers and so on. Um, in the regulations, you'll probably be aware that um, those other close contact services are actually separated out. They're actually different categories, um, but there has been an attempt to um, look at them now collectively. Uh, in terms of risk, because obviously the majority would be of similar risk. And whilst um, no decisions have been made by the executive yet, um, it, uh, it is likely that those other categories will be looked at with a view to a potential easement within a, within a similar time frame. Okay, and um, I suppose in terms of guidance as well, I mean, for instance, hairdressers getting ready to open up and barbers getting ready to open up for the sixth and beauty salons. Um, where is that um, departmental guidance for those individuals and businesses, uh, and when will that be published? Okay. Um, under the system we're currently operating, uh, individual departments with policy leads are bringing forward proposals for change, and obviously in relation to business, uh, retail and the economy in general, that's the department for the economy. Um, it's up to individual departments when they're proposing uh, easements to um, look at, uh, well, obviously engage with stakeholders, but obviously look at whether supporting guidance is required. And some of the um, staggered commencement dates that we're now seeing re reflect um, what departments think in terms of the need to give businesses uh, and indeed other sectors time to prepare or to publish guidance. Um, I am aware that um, Department of the Economy has produced quite a lot of guidance in recent days. Um, I have to say it's very hard to keep track from the Department of Health point of view uh, in what guidance different departments are issuing at what times. So um, I, I couldn't honestly say whether guidance has in fact uh, issued for that sector or is planned. But in terms of responsibility for considering that, that would currently fall with uh, to the Department of the, the, the Economy. Thank you. And uh, Orlea, do you have any questions for Nigel in this section? Um, yes, please. I, I just want to ask, I'm not sure if Nigel can maybe answer this one, but it's in the right, Nigel. Um, we've been getting loads of lobbies from, um, you know, like uh, Gamblers Anonymous and, um, you know, like addiction support groups. And I'm just wondering, have you any idea where, where they would fall, um, you know, under the, the lockdown evening at this stage? Yes, I think that's, that's another good point. Um, uh, uh, the sort of category of um, 
meetings, I suppose, including counselling of one sort or another and other types of groups uh, who are also coming forward to the department saying that they feel, given the facilities and premises that they have, that they could do um, uh, what, what, what they do and the important work that they do um, in a socially distanced way. So it is something we're looking at, whether there is a, sort of a category of, um, of easement or a change that we could make that would cover uh, would cover all of those types of activities or, or groups um, to allow them to, to, to get back to, to work. Okay. Thank you. Orlea? You quite okay, Orlea? Yes, thanks very much. Okay, Paula? Um, thank you. Um, my question's in relation to the holiday accommodation. I got a query there recently around people who are obviously delighted that they're going to be able to use their caravan this summer, but are they going to be able to have family members visit them and stay with them? in their caravans? That's the first question. Um, well, certainly in terms of the, the opening, they should be general open, uh, generally open for use. Um, I think as things stand, my interpretation would be um, if it's members of their own households, then clearly any number can stay, regardless of the size of, uh, of the family, if they, if they constitute a single household. Um, as things stand, if it's not members of the same household, then uh, they would be restricted to up to six, six people allowed to, um, to meet indoors. Okay, um, thank you. And the second one really is in, in relation then um, to the restaurants and bars opening in terms of the mixed tables at a, a restaurant owner in South Belfast contacted me yesterday to say, you know, can the six people sitting around the same table who are not necessarily social distancing, can they come from different households? Because you said she'd spent the last three months with her family and she wants to see other people now. So it's really just a bit more guidance for restaurants about how they enforce the regulations. Yeah, and again, I think the Department of the Economy are looking at, uh, around um, guidance on that. Um, I think uh, as things stand, it, 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 restaurants will need to be flexible enough to accommodate the situation where if they have a group who are from the same household, they wouldn't necessarily need to be restricted to six or indeed social distance. Um, but, but any other group um, coming together would, would need to social distance um, at a table, for example, um, and would need, to, would need to be restricted to six people. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, going across now to Colin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, Chairman, I suppose my first question relates to the scientific evidence. We, we keep getting told that we're being led by the scientific evidence. Um, then we get told that the, that the scientific evidence has been published, but I think maybe that was more reference to a paper that was released last week about the R number. So I suppose the question relates to is the R number the scientific evidence, or is the scientific evidence made up of more than just the R number? And is the scientific evidence just the opinion of people that are scientists, and therefore it's scientific opinion? And will that actually be published? Because we have a scenario where 200 people can go into a store, but they can't go into a place of worship. Um, we have families that can meet in a store and can talk and chat. Um, but they may not be allowed in and out of each other's homes. And I don't have a dog, but if I did, it could be groomed and I can't get a haircut. And it's trying to work out what, the, what is the scientific evidence um, and how is it constructed and how is it relayed to people? Okay, Nigel. Okay. Yep. Well, um, in terms of scientific evidence, obviously the chief scientific advisor is attending uh, meetings of the UK say group, which is really where UK governments and indeed the uh, governments are getting their main scientific advice from. Um, in terms of the way it's applied um, in the executive process, um, the package of uh, proposals coming from departments uh, include from those departments uh, their, their, their own risk assessment, if you like, based on whatever evidence they have available to them. It may well be in certain sectors that pieces of research and other uh, bits of evidence have, have been produced that departments can draw upon um, in suggesting that a certain relaxation um, be allowed to happen. Um, the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer then get sight um, of those proposals that come forward, including any, any evidence included by those departments. And based on the uh, meetings and advice that, 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 that they are involved in and aware of, um, 
then then they come to their own view about whether uh, this is something that the Department Department of Health can support in terms of a proposal going to the executive. So my understanding is it doesn't it doesn't result in a separately produced report, if you like, in relation to uh, to each of them. But his advice is provided um, um, to the executive by way of paper to the executive, and, and also um, generally the chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor, attend those executive meetings to answer any further questions on the evidence that um, that ministers may have before making their decision. Okay, um, I think I heard risk assessments, attendance at meetings, and then whether somebody supports something. But I still don't think that we're actually getting what you know. I think it's been presented to us in the in the media uh, by the executive, and it's been presented in the chamber that there is scientific evidence. But it seems to me that that's quite complex, and it may just be a series of opinions. Um, and obviously, as people are very uh, detrimentally impacted by the, the, what, what those decisions are, it would be good to get some further information. But I might write separately um, to you about that. Um, the other issue is that you know that document that was presented, the roadmap that we had at the start. Are, are we sticking to that, or is it now just because it seems to be that we're getting announcements twice a week? Uh, first of all, in the media, and then in an executive meeting, and then we eventually find out afterwards what it actually is. Um, are we sticking to that roadmap? And when you mentioned departmental guidance, is that legal, or is it just guidance? In other words, if somebody decides not to stick to the guidance, they aren't breaking the law. Um, in terms of the uh, executive plan, the program, obviously that's setting a direction of travel. I think it was always clear that in terms of the steps and what was included in the steps, that they would be um, subject to uh, progress with regard to the pandemic. Um, we've talked about um, the R value and the other key figures coming, coming down um, at a pace that has maybe allowed relaxations to happen more more quickly than might otherwise have been the case. Um, and as we said at the outset, it, the department actually has a legal responsibility to uh, remove those restrictions at the earliest opportunity when it becomes aware. With regard to guidance, obviously there's quite a lot of guidance out there and it's, it's difficult to, to um, talk in a very broad brush way about the status of that. Guidance uh, is, not, is not the law, so um, certainly if it's um, in guidance, uh, but not in the legislation. It is not able to be um, enforced. Um, so you're getting into the realms there of providing people with the information um, and trusting those in control of uh, businesses and sectors um, to make sure that the guidance is followed um, and, and trusting uh, citizens also to be sensible and to do, the, to do the same thing. With regard to the legal standing of the guidance, whilst it's not law and it's not enforceable, I understand gui uh, a formal guidance can still be legally challenged if people believe it to be um, incorrect in some way. Thank you for that, Nigel. Just, just by way of a, a, a linked issue to that, you've mentioned the Chief Scientific Advisor and his considerations and his deliberations within SAGE. What consideration is being given when, when the Department are bringing forward a proposal to ease restrictions? So, say, for example, um, how is that being considered in relation to the population, say, of Ockham Floy, in relation to what's happening in Emmy Vale, just across the border? And how is that north-south data being shared and inputted into the decisions that we're making here, in a practical sense? Well, there certainly are um, arrangements in place, um, as the committee is probably aware, for north-south liaison um, on these things. Um, I'm afraid I'm not particularly cited on to the extent to which data is actually shared, so I can't really answer that question, but it's something we could come back to the, the committee on with regard to that. Yeah, please, please do, because obviously if it's based on scientific advice, that science will have to include what's happening in areas that run cheek by jowl right along, right along that, that border and right throughout the island, given in the interconnection of commerce and social life and all of that. Okay, so I would appreciate more information on that, Nigel, indeed. Thank you. I'm going now to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, Senator really Colin, there's a lot of concern here about the, the scientific advice. Um, the former Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government, um, Sir David King, has warned that there could be a serious risk uh, of a second wave because of lockdown lifting measures now. And he, he says, and I quote, I think it's extraordinary 
extraordinarily risky. Um, and we are being told to follow on from Colin that we're being gated by the signs, but we haven't been presented with what that is. And I think there's an element of uh, the health committee um, being told or, or being uh, inferred that they should have blind faith to accept that. And I think it's very, very concerning. There's concern from multiple uh, scientific sources that we're moving far too quickly. Uh, and this, with the, the aspect of uh, non essential retail essentially being. Uh, being lifted with this uh, amendment, uh, it's one of the last major blocks of, of the lockdown. Um, so I still um, at odds to to know what the scientific evidence or rationale is for this amendment, uh, specifically the aspect around non-essential retail being open. Yeah, well, I think so. Your uh, comments are duly noted, and um, if the committee intends to write to ask for more. Um, information around um, the, the, the advice and the publication of that, then, then we'll certainly respond to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go on across to Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a couple of um, the announcements on different relaxations, such as hairdressers, but um, it doesn't explain um, some of the. the the guidelines does that extend to people who are operating hairdressing at home? So can you maybe clarify that for me? Also, I've had a few tattoo businesses on, on to me about why they're not included. Because if you look at hairdressing and, and beauty, they're quite close contact. And, and, and um, I'm wondering where we are with that level of business. Um, my last wee bit is, um, whenever these all come out, it's quite slow for the guidelines to go down to local councils and stuff like that, who are obviously going to enforce um, any of the rules and stuff. So um, is there any way that can be looked at to speed that process of getting the guidelines down to where they need to more quicker? OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, on the first question about the hairdressers, um, obviously hairdressers are allowed to open shortly. Um, it, uh, there should be no prohibition on uh, somebody then going into somebody's uh, home to do that as a home service, um, as long as obviously there are not more than six people in the house, so a hairdresser should be able to, to visit the home to, to, to provide services in that, that way. Um, I would imagine. I think the question on tattoo parlours really goes back, I suppose, to my answer to, to Pam Cameron earlier on, which is that um, they do accept that um, in bringing forward this amendment now for some close contact services, there's a need to look um, quickly at um, how that impacts on, on others, including tattoos and, and, and massage parlours and indeed spas as well. And that is under active consideration at the moment. Um, um, Potentially, with a view to bringing forward a further uh, amendment that would bring those those other close contact services into the line within the same or similar time time frame. Um, on the final question um, on guidance and getting that to councils, again, you know, the range of departments now producing guidance, and I can't really um, uh, talk, talk to that in terms of what their plans are and how they communicate that. From the Department of Health's point of view, you may be aware that we, we've tried to produce overall guidance in relation to um, the interpretation of the regulations, um, which is available on our website online now. As a matter of course, whenever the new amendment regulations are made um, and that guidance is updated and amended, which we try to do as soon as we can after the, the regulations are amended, um, those are actively sent to um, district councils through the heads of service for environmental health who have the enforcement role um, imme immediately after they are they are published. So they, do, they certainly receive the Department of Health guidance and the copies of the new regulations just as, just as soon as they are, they are, they are made. Um, I would just add actually, and probably of interest to the, the chair who's asked us about this on a number of occasions about um, producing things in, in other languages and reaching other communities. Just I'm glad to be able to say now that uh, the guidance is available on the Department of Health website in, in, in several other languages now as well, um, in the most used languages in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, Nigel, and uh, I'll have a look at that just to see what, what the languages are. But that's, that's welcome news, I have to say. Thank you for that. Um, 
just want to also flag up, I don't think there's any other members at this stage, but uh, there is a two significant issues I suppose that, that a lot of probably a lot of members are getting representation on, and that's one of them is the issue of partners being allowed to accompany uh, pregnant women on maternity visits is, is an area of significant concern, and also the issue of relatives visiting care homes. Um, are there any uh, considerations ongoing at this point in time in relation to those two areas? I believe that there are, um, Chair, at the moment that those are being looked at um, uh, in, in another part of the Parliament. Obviously, they don't relate specifically to the, the regulations. You know, I don't believe that they would require a, um, a legislative amendment for that. Um, so it's probably a matter of health and social care policy, but I do believe they're under consideration at the moment. Okay, thank you. One more from Pam. There, Nigel, please. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Um, thank you for that uh, clarity on the chair's question. Um, was just to ask if, um, obviously, if the if there's a negative impact on the R number with the easing of restrictions, and if potentially it looks like the health and social care um, may well be overwhelmed, as what we worried with the first wave. Um, are there any logistical barriers to reversing these measures and, and stepping back? Um, I think the short answer is uh, uh, no, certainly in terms of um, legally and technically. That is something we have been considering. There is no reason why um, restrictions couldn't be uh, reintroduced um, just as quickly in, in legislative terms um, as they're being relaxed at the moment. I, I suppose the challenge for us all would be um, you know how would uh, the public respond to that? I think you know there is an issue there about once once people have their newfound freedoms, it's, uh, I think it's accepted. It will be much more difficult to reintroduce restrictions for a second time than it would have been the first time round. Uh, but certainly, in terms of the, the legislative question, there's no reason why why that couldn't be done uh, in, in, in a speedy way. We we are hoping to look at a restructuring of the regulations. Um, the committee will be more aware than most with the seven sets of amendments about how unwieldy uh, and difficult they've become to navigate. And we would like to sort of look at restructuring those. And one of the things that we might want to look at is whether there is a, a way of doing that that would actually make uh, reintroducing restrictions um, more straightforward and possibly uh, uh, clearer in terms of the content and, and impact to, to the public and, and to others. But that is under active consideration as well. Thank you. Okay, Nigel, thank you. That's everything for now. So we appreciate you coming along and briefing the committee and responding to those questions. And thank you for now and all the best for now. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Members, any other uh, comments or discussion in relation to that? Alan first? Yeah. Uh, and then Pam, then Jerry? Sure. Just, just uh, uh, an observation, and, and I'll put my hand up. I'm uh, probably as, as guilty as everybody of this. But Nigel uh, is on uh, he's a specific role to draw up legislation and he brings it to us for our consideration and we're perfectly entitled to quiz him about whatever relaxation is in front of us. Um, but you know, particularly even there this morning, um, we drift into asking him about stuff that's coming down the line and how it might impact and so forth. Uh, and I'm not sure that Nigel really is is qualified to to maybe um, offer opinions or uh, explain a rationale uh, behind decisions that are actually been taken by the executive. So you know uh, uh, maybe we are been a wee bit unfair at times. But would it not be more appropriate if, if we do have concerns about what's coming down? I and mean, we all do. Um, you know, could we maybe not invite the uh, the junior ministers um, from the executive to come and appear before us, where we could ask those uh, more detailed questions about what is the rationale, why, like the question that Colm um, posed, you know, why can you go into shops but you can't go into a place of worship? I, I don't think Nigel is really the man to answer that question, and I don't think it's for her even to ask him that question. But the, uh, it does put him into maybe a bit of an embarrassing position where he, he starts to offer maybe his, his personal opinion. Uh, so, you, you know, could I suggest maybe that, that might be a thought for our future programme that we bring the junior ministers along and, and really quiz them on the rationale behind 
um, the, the relaxations and, and ask questions about the um, about the roadmap. You know, are are they adhering to it, or you know, what what is the approach? I think it might be useful. Okay, Alan. Well, I suppose uh, in the first instance, Nigel has appeared many times now and is quite capable and has done said where issues are beyond his his remit or his role that he's not, and he, he is willing to look at getting others uh, in place. So I think that's appropriate. I think some latitude around potential future, given given the cascading effect of a lot of these, I think it's inevitable that members will have some questions, and I think those are those are fair enough. Um, I will I will take on board your suggestion, but I am conscious of the issue that was raised last week in terms of straying outside of our remit and and and. Uh, Examining other other work, the, the the work of other committees potentially, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily rule that out. I think the more engagement we have, the better. But I think it's it's uh, it's one for consideration. But I don't think there's any issue with Aston Nigel. And if it is something that he's not qualified or confident or or has or knows at that particular time, he can let us know and either either come back or whatever. Uh, going to go then to Alan. Uh, sorry, Pam was next. Yep. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it's really on the back of your questions there, and you know I've. I've raised this with the Minister, the, the maternity services and and also visitation of um, care homes. I think these are major, major issues. I think it would be good if the committee would agree to, to write directly to the department specifically on those two issues for now, uh, to ask where they are progressing them, because I think they're, they're really vital that they're addressed um, as soon as possible, because I think they, there's, there's an awful lot of harm can come from that, that deprivation in particular. To the care home settings, um, and to um, individuals not being able to see um, family or friends. Yeah, and we also have the benefit of that the minister and chief medical officer are coming on Tuesday, so there are some of these things that we can certainly raise there. But I think that that's that's a useful suggestion that we write. Has everybody agreed that we write that letter asking for those areas to be looked at? Yeah. So we, we're we're asking the department to advise the committee on what steps are taken to look at those two particular areas. Please. Okay. Um, sorry, Chair, sorry, can I just check the two areas are care homes and is it visiting in maternity and antenatal units as well as visiting at care homes? Then, yeah. yeah. Uh, is as much about accompanying them to the antenatal appointments if that's. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know even you know the actual birth. I know there's restrictions even at that point, which is. Yeah, and in, in, in terms of scans, I mean, there's 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 bonding and attachment issues and all tied up. You know, these yes. are quite important, apart from just the, the the family and the emotive and the human element of it. There are important issues there um, that that have that have had to be sacrificed for a period of time. But I think it's it, they are significant areas of of interaction that people are keen to get some clarity on at, at the very least, or if if not, moves towards. Um, sorry, I have. Uh, I'm going back to my order list there. Um, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of points on this. Um, I'm still concerned that we'll have the scientific rationale for this amendment. Um, and I think I raise concern there about there's a swathe of medical experts in Ireland um, warning we're moving too quickly. Um, SAGE and Independent SAGE have said something similar. Uh, and essentially, the, the part of this amendment uh, which will move. Um, will allow non-essential businesses to open will mean large numbers of people being forced uh, back into work and we've seen that already obviously this amendment is already in place um, people go back into work wage furlough still remains so, so that's very very concerning i have no issue with the aspects around caravan parks and other issues where people can make the choice and um, to to go to various places but i do have an issue with people being forced back into work so so my proposal I think we should support removing the aspects where people uh, are being forced uh, back in the work and the aspects of this amendment that pertains to lifting the uh, restrictions on non-essential businesses being allowed to open. And I'm concerned, to be frank, Chair, that this is being uh, driven by big business interests and economic competition with the South, rather than any clear public health um, uh, guidance or evidence. And we still we didn't hear that uh, this morning. So I want to propose that, that we do that. Okay, members' views on that proposal. So, what what is it, what is your proposal, Jerry? Are you saying that we will we will uh, agree to some elements of this, but not others? Is that even that's, possible? That's like, just just give me a second to ask the clerk for. Sorry, just to be clear, the, the committee has a yes or no yeah. um, decision to make in respect to this. As I was saying earlier, the statutory rules can't be amended at this point. That doesn't mean, however, that you could. 
give your view and then in your speech in the chamber call for consideration to be given to further amending certain aspects uh, that remember this statutory rule is in operation already um, but there's nothing to stop members or the committee as a group calling on the minister to review certain aspects and take a new position on certain aspects but for the moment on this one the question is whether the committee uh, would support uh, the confirmatory motion in the chamber which is on Tuesday. To clarify, Chair, can we request that the Department come back to us with those aspects taken out of the amendment, and we can therefore support that amendment as try that um, amendment the regulations as changed with those aspects changed? Yes, Chair. So the as I said, the, the statute is in operation already. So the committee could take two decisions. It could take first of all, it has to take a decision on whether or not it would support on Tuesday the uh, confirmation of the existing regulations, which would allow things that have opened already to continue until something else should happen. Second of all, the committee could decide to ask the minister to review certain aspects and to bring forward further amendments to deliver what the committee thinks should be delivered or considered. And you, you would expect that, that would come, first of all, in the normal process with an SL1 policy proposal for consideration and then an SR. In this case, given that everything is being done by emergency procedure, um, one might expect that, that if the Minister were to agree to bring forward changes, that that would probably come forward in the same way by way of the emergency procedure to change certain aspects um, and then subject to the confirmatory procedure once again. I'm not sure if that's answered the question fully, has it? Okay, I'm going to go to Colin. Um, yeah, Tara, and um, I suppose a couple of things rolled into one. Number one, uh, I don't envy the position, but note Alan's weekly defence of the health department officials. But I suppose that's because that's the department where the minister is. Um, but you know, this is our chief environmental health officer who is presenting a change to the laws that impact everybody in the north of Ireland. I think we should be at least afforded the opportunity to ask him a question: uh, that is, why are you taking this decision? Or why has this decision been taken? I don't think that's unreasonable, and I think actually uh, we would be absenting ourselves from our scrutiny rule if we didn't ask uh, somebody that's presenting to us a substantial change to the law. But the point that he makes, which I think is uh, valid, is that about maybe asking it off ministers who take the decisions as opposed to the people that come and present it. Um, by way, just of an update, Chair, um, my role as Chair of the Executive Office on next Wednesday, we have the First and Deputy First Minister to come in and give an update on um, the uh, executive response to the coronavirus. And maybe if there are a series of questions, if this committee could write to the Executive Office to table those questions, I'm sure we could ensure that those questions are put to the First and Deputy First Minister next Wednesday um, to get some of the rationale that's behind it. Um, and I take um, some of the points that uh, Jerry was making in so far as the, uh, the scientific evidence. I think we should, we should write to the department and ask for a detailed paper telling us how scientific evidence, which is almost in inverted commas, and I think now is even more so in inverted commas because it's somebody attends a meeting, somebody reads a paper, somebody has an opinion, and then that's all put in the mixing bowl and it's presented at the daily briefings by the executive uh, of uh, members and in the chamber as that's the scientific evidence, so that's a decision taken. We don't know what's in that mixing bowl, and I think we've asked on a number of occasions now for that, and we don't seem to be getting it. And um, the chief uh, environmental health officer did give us some idea of what was there, but I think we need to get a formal understanding of what it is. That should, I think, underpin um, what Jerry was saying about if if the scientific evidence and we get the detailed list of what it is tells us that it's safe for people to go back to work, then there may not be any need to change the opinion. Sir. So I just think we need that knowledge, because we can't scrutinise if we don't know why decisions are being taken. Okay. Thank you. Paula? Um, thank you. I just wanted to go back to Alan's, um, notwithstanding what um, Collins just said there, and what you said as well. I think that there is merit in asking the two junior ministers to come along, and if we were to restrict our comments and questioning to them in relation to health issues, I think that that would be very beneficial because we are hearing the finer detail of the impact of the changes in the, reg the regulations and then the amendments as health spokespersons. And I just don't, I'm not sure that they would have that granular detail in front of them because, if, as you say, they have to cover all the departments. So I think it would be very useful if we had them here that they could hear. 
from us on behalf of the charities and individuals who have contacted us about aspects of the health regs that affect them. Okay. Pat? Uh, uh, Chair, I just wanted to come in on, on this issue of scientific evidence that Colin was talking about there. You know, and If you remember the last time the Chief Scientific Advisor was in with us, he said that he, he, he was a bit concerned when he went into shops and he was the only one uh, wearing a face mask. And I listened to him on uh, the radio the other morning there, saying that uh, if everyone uh, was to wear a face covering or face mask, it would significantly reduce the transmission of the virus. Now, that's our chief scientific officer saying that. He seems to be basing what he's saying on some sort of evidence. I don't know whether it's scientific evidence or not, but why is this discussion not even taking place except in the context of well, the South are now making it mandatory to wear face masks on public transport. Across the water has done that, and now we're talking about doing it. You know, and I've been saying for quite a long time that there does seem to be some evidence, albeit anecdotal, because in all of these issues, whether it's hand washing, social distancing, wearing face coverings, or whatever, to get uh, you know proper scientific evidence, there needs to be randomised trials carried out. And they haven't been carried out. But if the chief scientific officer is saying the wearing of face coverings or face masks would significantly reduce the transmission of the virus, you know, we need to be talking about it, especially in the context of all these relaxations. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen the photographs of the beaches in England yesterday. It's absolutely crazy. And if that's a situation that develops, in the context of the continuing relaxation, you know, make no mistake, there's going to be a second surge. Okay, thank you, Pat and Pam. Thank you, Chair. Just in the back of Pat's comment, really, I mean, and I know the the first deputy first minister have raised it on numerous occasions. They have, um, they've definitely referred to um, it being useful or you know should be considered wearing of um, face coverings or masks. Well, it definitely is out there, and maybe. We're all responsible for that. Maybe not pushing the message enough, um, along with the message of actually, if you have a symptom, you should go and get tested. I don't think that's really out there either, and I think that's vital for the, for the contact tracing. Okay, uh, I'm going to check with Arlea on the phone. Arlea, do you have anything there that you want to mention, suggest, or comment? Uh, no, maybe if you could just clarify, Chair, what the proposal is here. Well, there's a number of proposals which I'm going to just go through uh, kind of one by one. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the scientific evidence, there's a proposal that we write asking for more detail on how that evidence is considered, um, what, what, the, what the scientific uh, evidence is that these measures are based on. Are members content to agree with that? Yep, yeah, members are content with that. Um, the second one then is in terms of writing, uh, suggesting that we write to the TOE committee with a number of questions that we would have in relation to, to the links. Is that, Colin, you think you think the scientific evidence wouldn't be dealing with that better, does it? Uh, it was just a, it's just an offer. Maybe even if people talk to their their party representatives that are on that committee. They, if there are any specific questions, it's just it's six days away, and it's an opportunity to raise questions about why is this in and that not? Why are we following this idea and not that idea? Those are the sort of questions that members will be putting. I, I would suspect next week. So, okay. I'm also very conscious again that we do have the minister and the CMO <coughs> with us on Tuesday, so we can we can put a number of these. In relation to the two junior ministers, our link with the executive is really through the, the, the minister for health. So I would just like to take some advice on that. I don't want to make I don't want to, I'm not I just would like to take some further advice on that before we decide if that's uh, something that would be appropriate and useful or whatever. And then. Um, so we, we then we then need to consider the uh, so those those are agreed, um, but we also need to consider the actual. Sorry, Clark. So just clarify: is the committee agreeing to write to the executive office, or this, the alternative was? I think the member said individual members to contact their party representatives on that committee. So yeah, I think quite clear now, what the agreement was there. For now, we were agreeing that, that, that we would take no formal. We wouldn't write formally from the committee that members would do that individually. For now, and um, we were more more focused on writing to get the scientific. Mr. Chairman, in, in relation to the junior ministers, who are you going to seek advice from? Um, well, I'll discuss with, with the clerk and with the assembly. Just, uh, I want to be sure that that's an appropriate, an appropriate 
a vehicle for us. Um, so, uh, but yes. Uh, just on that, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to the junior ministers being invited to come before us, but I just think in the circumstance where Colm's saying that, you know, they have a, a TEO meeting six days away and we do have the minister and CMO coming on Tuesday. So I think we've probably enough um, room there to... Yeah, but the, the situation is that the decisions that are taken, these decisions are not the decision of the Minister of Health. These are the decisions, collective, taken by all the members of the executive. They're executive decisions. Uh, the Health Minister can certainly comment on them, uh, but you know, the, somebody has to be able to give us the collective thoughts of, of the executive. I'm not sure that one minister uh, would be empowered to speak for the other ministers, but I think the two junior ministers uh, would be able to give us a flavour uh, of what the thinking uh, going forward is within the executive and, and whether they are adhering to this, uh, this roadmap. And similar to Pam, I'm not opposed to them coming or us asking them, but I do want to ensure that, that it's appropriate. I mean, our scrutiny is in relation to the Department of Health, and I want to ensure that we're not crossing over there into any other, any other areas. So I'm not ruling that either, but I think it's something that I would like to consider more fully. Perhaps to the chair, maybe the clerk could advise us now. No. I would just like to take some advice myself. Obviously, it's an unorthodox move for a committee to um, seek to scrutinise ministers from a different department. Um, particularly if that department reports to another committee on this particular matter. It, so I would like to just explore that with colleagues and get some advice, if that's okay. Are members content that we come back to that after, after some further guidance? Okay, thank you. So I'm then going to go to the, uh, the statutory rule itself and have many members, uh, have, if not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 103, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 6, Regulations NA 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Are members agreed? Agreed. That's concerned with the Chair. I, I, I can't support it. Yeah. Okay. With, with those. Comments, yeah, okay. And it, uh, it just just want to advise members at that point that the SR, this SR, and the number five that we discussed last week, are being considered at, are scheduled for debate in the assembly on Tuesday. So there's an opportunity for members to speak speak to it in that in that sense. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, moving on now to number six, SR 2020 forward slash 104, the misuse of drugs amendment number two, regulations NA 2020. The Department has made the statutory rule to amend the Misuse of Drugs regulations to allow for fewer restrictions on the prescribing and supply of the cannabis-based medicine Epidiolex. Can I remind members that the Committee received a briefing from the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer and other officials on the SL1 at the meeting on 11 June and agreed that we were content that the Department <coughs> make the statutory rule? The Department advises that there has been no change to policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee. The regulations came into force on the 24th of June and are subject to negative resolution. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this SR. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Orlea, are you okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So. Um, yeah, uh, so now, uh, will it, with, with, with there being no objections, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 104, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment No. 2 regulations, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Great. 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 Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020-106. The Mental Capacity Deprivation of Liberty Amendment Revocation Regulations NA 2020. The Department has made a statutory rule to revoke the Mental Capacity Deprivation of Liberty Amendment Regulations. The Department has advised that the modifications provided by the original temporary regulations are no longer required. And members, I think this, this follows a significant and a very useful engagement with the Committee uh, in the Department in respect to that, and I think it was an example of, of a a very good piece of interaction between us and them to raise our concerns and to keep an eye on how that was being manifested in terms of the implementation of it. So I think it's, it's, it's worth noting that. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this SR, which is subject to negative resolution. 
Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with statutory rule? Sorry. I don't know if it's the committee's uh, remit, but um, I think we had a quite a lot of correspondence uh, relating to this. Um, can we request that the department uh, write to the, the organisations, just informing them of the, the change? I'm assuming they're going to do it anyway, but just in case uh, they don't. Yeah, members are happy, content with that suggestion. Yeah, agreed with that. that, that uh, we write to, to advise the organisations of that outcome. Um, so. If members then have no other issues to raise, can I put the question that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020-106, the Mental Capacity Deprivation of Liberty Amendment Revocation Regulations NI 2020, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Yep. Thank you, members. So, members, um, yeah, we can we can continue. Yeah. Okay. So, members, we're now moving straight on to our next session, which is a, a response to, in part of our, our ongoing work in relation to COVID-19 disease response. And we are joined this morning by the chief social worker and uh, Mr. Mark Lee. Can I advise members that departmental officials are here today uh, to update the committee on issues around adult social care? I refer members to tab eight of your pack. A briefing note from the chief social worker. Correspondents from the Human Rights Commission and the Clerk's Memo are at tab 8 of your table papers. We would like now to welcome Mr Sean Holland, Chief Social Worker from the Department, and Mr Mark Lee, Director of Mental Health, Disability and Older People. And you are both very welcome here this morning, gentlemen, and please go ahead and brief the committee. Hello, Chair. Um, good to be here. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to update you um, uh, on uh, What's happening in the adult social care sector, obviously, with particular reference to the impact that COVID-19 has had. Um, since the outbreak uh, in Northern Ireland, adult social care services have, as you'll all be aware, been placed under immense pressure. Um, care homes have certainly borne the biggest impact uh, of this in terms of infection rates and deaths. Um, uh, but uh, domiciliary care, daycare services, supported living, um, family caring and unpaid carers and young carers have all, all been seriously impacted by uh, the, the past few months. Um, as I say, media attention is certainly focused on um, uh, the uh, care home sector, uh, inevitably due to the high numbers of deaths recorded in the sector, but increasingly uh, the impact of scaling back other services, uh, we're seeing the impact that that's had on families and communities, um, and that's going to be a crucial factor as we look to restarting um, and recovering from uh, the pandemic so far. Uh, trusts have reshaped their services, um, uh, and obviously we've tried to prioritise uh, a focus on outreaching to the most vulnerable, um, uh, and that has uh, resulted in an intensive approach, certainly, but it's meant that many other families who would have normally accessed support have not been supported in the way they normally would have been, um, and the consequences of that are still emerging. Uh, and we're having to understand and respond to that. Works are un well underway to assess where we are, what the impact has been, and how we can re-establish uh, and recover services. But it's going to be hugely challenging um, uh, 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 and resource-intensive for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I think there are probably uh, three different elements to that. One is pent-up demand, so where you haven't been responding to uh, difficulties and, and needs that people have experienced because of the impact of COVID, that has built up. Uh, the other is the uh, now trying to operate in this stage of a pandemic where we're trying to deliver a wider range of services, but uh, in the context of uh, complying with social distancing um, uh, uh, and other factors, that has an impact on productivity and capacity. And then thirdly, uh, is the actual impact of COVID-19 creating new demand in and of itself. Uh, and that can be a variety of factors ranging from uh, your mental health uh, needs being uh, impacted in terms of people experiencing PTSD, increased anxiety, uh, what have you. Uh, also, through to new social care demands, which we, we're only starting to, to see emerging because of the consequences for some people who have been ill and are left uh, with debilitating conditions. And we don't know how long those are going to last, but certainly anecdotally, we're coming across people who um, uh, will probably be reliant on care for a significant period of time, having previously been fit and well. Um, 
We are putting in place uh, some support for those who are providing unpaid care. Uh, so we've uh, issued guidance for unpaid carers on the 10th of April. And that's been updated since. Um, we've also uh, tried to support people by participating and supporting the uh, use of a carer's ID scheme, which was launched on the 8th of June. Uh, we continue to provide significant support to care homes, um, uh, PPE. Um, has been provided in very significant numbers. Uh, I think some 17 million items have been provided to the care home sector, um, 27 million items to the social care sector overall. That's the non-statutory sector. That's what we've provided to uh, other providers. Um, on the 2nd of June, Minister announced £11.7 million pound package of investment to support care homes, uh, particular focus on care homes uh, enhancing cleaning, uh, provision of new equipment um, to help with the clinical management of re residents, also to uh, facilitate communication between relatives and residents, which I know is an issue that uh, the committee have been uh, hearing from others about, uh, and sick pay for staff who, who won't be able to attend should they become ill in the future. Uh, this was on top of a previous £6.5 million pound investment uh, that was announced on the 27th uh, of April. Uh, these funding packages are part of a wider and comprehensive package of financial support across the adult social care sector, as well as guaranteeing income for care homes uh, and domiciliary care providers. Uh, we've asked uh, trusts, uh, and we did this at the beginning of, of, of the pandemic, to ensure that where they had contracts with voluntary and community sector organisations, as those organisations potentially faced uh, an inability to deliver services in the way they were contracted to, for reasons beyond their control, we said, please continue to pay them as per contract, because we thought it was important that we didn't destabilise those organisations and potentially lose those organisations, which were going to be crucial to restarting when uh, we uh, uh, came out the other side of the pandemic. Uh, we've worked very closely with colleagues in the Department for Communities, um, uh, uh, particularly in relation to supported living, um, uh, which, as you know, is uh, an arrangement of, of close cooperation between uh, health and social care uh, and communities and particularly housing where we, we um in partnership work to provide housing with care uh, and we supported the uh, work of uh, DFC to secure £10 million uh, to support that sector and in advance of them being able to secure that money we included uh, supported living providers in the arrangements that we had in place for accessing PPE from trusts. Um, we have also provided significant uh, staff support to the care home sector um, and this has been I think unique throughout the United Kingdom. I'm not aware of this happening in other parts of the UK and it reflects uh, the integrated health and social care arrangements here where we were able to go to our health trusts and say you need to uh, wrap uh, your resources around uh, care homes and to date I think they've provided some 17,000 hours of trust staff time delivered directly into care homes um, uh, and that has been received uh, very positively by uh, care homes. Currently we're at the point where nearly all care homes are rating themselves green on a, a RAG rating uh, in relation to uh, staffing. Um, Committees previously heard from the Chief Medical Officer about the programme of testing in care homes, uh, uh, and that work has continued as of uh, Monday of this week. Uh, uh Information I have says 85% of residents have tested and more than 15,000 care home staff have been tested. Um, uh, and uh, it's hoped that uh, uh, all staff and residents will be tested by the end of this month. Um, uh, and my understanding is that we're on target to be able to achieve that. Nevertheless, there is uh, much more to do. Um, uh, the Minister's recently announced uh, a new framework for nursing, medical, multidisciplinary inreach into care homes. Uh, that's going to be led by my colleague, the Chief Nursing Officer, Charlotte McArdle, and that's partly recognising a long-standing uh, change in the uh, profile of people who are living in care homes, in that there is a growing level of acuity of healthcare need, um, but it's also been exacerbated by the experience of uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, Charlotte is also going to lead on a rapid learning initiative, um, which uh, is intended to uh, assess uh, what were the most effective supports that were provided to the sector, and particularly it's going to be important as we consider the possibility of future outbreaks, uh, be those isolated to individual facilities or 
We have to acknowledge the possibility of a second wave or surge of pandemic. Um, and it's important that where we can improve on our performance uh, from our initial experience, that we try and do everything within our power to make sure that we do so. And so that rapid learning initiative is going to be um, very uh, central to that. Um, Domiciliary care has also faced very significant challenges. Um, we supported that sector. Again, we uh, tried to ensure that uh, uh, there was funding continuity when organisations weren't necessarily able to deliver against the contracted hours that they were engaged in because uh, there was a period when, understandably, uh, some uh, individuals and families uh, did not want to let a carer into their home for, for entirely understandable reasons. Also, as their more extended network of support were maybe not at work, uh, they were in a place where they wanted to provide more care to carers. Now, we felt it was important that we didn't destabilise those domiciliary care providers because we knew that we were going to need them as we moved into recovery. So financial sustainability was very important uh, for, for, for them. Um, the challenges facing sector are reflected in the strategic framework for rebuilding uh, services that was published on the 9th of this month and work is underway uh, as i've said to develop recovery plans uh, and to reconsider and refresh our surge plans if we have any resurgence um, of covid19 i think it's really important to say that and i suspect were you to talk to any official from the department for any area of our responsibilities, they would be saying exactly the same thing. Services will not be normal um, for some time to come. Um, uh, and that's not simply going to be not normal because we'll be uh, seeing a lot of hand sanitizer and perspex screens and uh, social distancing. They won't be normal because we will not be able to return to capacity um, uh, and productivity levels and manage uh, both the increased demand and deliver services consistent with uh, those social distancing measures that are going to be required for some time. Uh, and it's very, very important that we don't simply use that as a, an excuse not to do the very best that we can, but equally we have to manage expectations for the public of Northern Ireland um, and be honest with them that there are going to be lasting impacts on our ability to deliver services uh, coming out of pandemic. Um, as the Ministers made clear, um, uh, the challenge of COVID-19 has brought into stark relief an issue that I've certainly discussed with um, yourself, Chair, and any of your predecessors and appearances at this committee, and that is that social care is absolutely an essential component part of health and social care. It should be valued in its own right, but it also is inextricably linked to the performance of our health care system. Uh, we have uh, experienced many years of uh, uh, underinvestment in that sector. Uh, we have stretched that sector incredibly. Um, uh, I, I think that you know we often talk about um, you know, public money and value. I do not think there is a pound in the public sector from which we extract more value than a pound spent on domiciliary care, for example. To the extent that I think that we've extracted so much value, it's not sustainable. The long term and we really have to revisit our attitude our approach and our funding to that sector the minister certainly believes that to be the case and that will be a focus as well for uh, the work that we need to do as we go forward that concludes the comments i would like to make um uh, chair and uh, myself and mark happy to try and respond to questions as always if we aren't sure of an answer uh, rather than uh, try and wing it we, we will we'll, we'll say that we don't have the information but we will follow up with uh, a response as quickly as possible in writing okay thank you chief social worker and uh, just to say as well in, in relation to your closing remarks there in in and i agree that we have squeezed every every penny out of that pound of, of spend in social care to the degree where it is, it is creating significant problems. But I also, I suppose, would want to add to that that the value that the entire system derives from that spending in terms of supporting people to live in their own homes, in terms of their well-being, their mental health, their physical health, that there's probably no better spent pound in relation to the, the overall outcomes for people as well. I 
Well, totally agree with you. I, th- I think that's that's a fundamental point. Um, so I suppose going back the first time, the first time that I recall mentioning to you here, the care home sector was on the fifth of March when I had asked in relation to the planning for care homes um, and, and what was going to happen. The uh, the coronavirus was looming. We were seeing what was happening across the world at that at that point in time, and I suppose we have all, and as a committee, we have watched the. Uh, horrendous impact that the virus has had in terms of the care home settings, to the extent where now over 50% of the deaths are from, from people in that setting. Now, in that context, um, I was extremely uh, d- dismayed recently to see where on the, uh, I think the 28th of April, the Richard Pengali issued a letter to trusts stating that they were not to allow a, a return of a test or indeed a positive test to allow uh, a delay, any delay to discharge into those homes. Is there any work ongoing in relation to the impact of that decision? And would that, and you have mentioned the second wave and planning for a second wave, is that going to impact on how we would deal with that issue and better protect the care homes in any potential second wave? Okay. Um, the, uh, along with a number of decisions uh, that were taken, they will be considered and reviewed uh, to see what learning can be extracted. But if I can take us back a little bit, I think it's important to be clear um, about uh, some of the reasons why uh, people are discharged from uh, hospitals into care homes. The first thing to say is that it's important to recognise that the discharge is a clinical decision. Um, uh, the, the, the clinician who is uh, overseeing the care of the individual will make the determination that someone should be discharged. Uh, uh, and that is made knowing where they will be discharged to. Uh, the second thing is to say that uh, we have to recognise that even in the best of times, uh, it's not a good idea for people uh, who um, are frail, or, or indeed anyone, to be in an acute hospital for any longer than they need. Quite often this is framed as a, a, a case of you know, the system wanting to clear beds because it's expensive to have people in beds. That's not Okay, sorry. Sorry. That's, that's not actually uh, the primary motivation. Uh, the reality is that when someone uh, is in hospital for longer than they should be, even outside of the pandemic, their risk of acquiring a, a hospital-acquired infection is high. Uh, the risk of them becoming increasingly fail, frail and debilitated is there. Um, you know, the longer you're in an acute hospital, your mobility goes down uh, for uh, uh, older people. There are a whole range of reasons why you should always seek to move people out of hospital as quickly as possible. Uh, Thirdly, uh, I think that it is also important to recall that we were looking at the collapse of acute healthcare facilities in other parts of Europe. Uh, Those facilities were becoming absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, We saw it certainly in Italy, we saw it in Spain, uh, we saw it in parts of France. Um, And so uh, it, it was certainly true that we felt that it was important to make sure that we were able to maintain an acute healthcare system that could respond to the pandemic. And finally, Uh, The guidance that uh, uh, has been issued and was issued in relation to uh, discharges made it absolutely clear that people should only be discharged uh, to care homes where a care home could adequately manage the care of that patient. Now, uh, I think that was based on the fact that care homes uh, every year manage outbreaks of uh, communicable diseases, um, uh, ranging from uh, uh, um, uh, gastroenteritis through to flu and what have you, and they do manage those outbreaks. Um, I think that uh, at that stage, uh, no one fully understood um, uh, the particular qualities of coronavirus in terms of uh, 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 how infectious it was and the routes of transmission. But certainly, uh, based on the experience of care homes in managing uh, outbreaks uh, and infectious uh, conditions uh, every year, um, we, we said uh, clearly in guidance that uh, people should only be discharged to a care home where they could practice barrier nursing appropriately to contain an infection. Um, now, I think we need to look back at all of those uh, positions and all of those choices, but those were uh, the, the factors and, and features of those decisions. But, sorry, John, there's, there's, a, there's a number of things relating to that, that that I just want to pick up on. Yep. First of all, the clinical decision, Megan, and we all understand that. 
But we were not operating in a situation where clinical decisions were able to be. So other clinical decisions that you would have made around bringing a red flag cancer or, or other people for clinical decisions had to be deferred. There was also the issue of the particular, and I, I, I recognise what you're saying about the general infection procedures and all of that, but in this particular outbreak, there was particular vulnerabilities for people who lived in care homes and also particularly particular transmission issues around coronavirus in congregated settings. Um, the other thing, and, and, and probably the most significant thing that I want you to reflect on and to answer is, you said about the surge of overwhelming the hospitals. It was clear on the 28th of April that that wasn't happening. So, therefore, why was that issue? Why, why was that directive being reinforced? In I understand bold print at that period of time. Uh, I would have to go and check the antecedents of that particular letter, but certainly the policy, it wasn't a change of policy. I mean, the position had been uh, from a much earlier uh, 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 point in time that uh, uh, people were being discharged from acute settings into care home settings. Um, but should the policy have changed? That's well, I think, I think that we need to undertake an exercise to reevaluate a whole range of decisions and see whether or not the evidence was there to support them at a particular point in time. Um, but I think that uh, overall, I've set out why uh, people were being discharged from care homes, why people felt it was reasonable. That will be subject to scrutiny. The, um, the second point then in relation to developments this week, and uh, we have had the series of the series of Cherry Tree, Dunmurray Manor, and Muckamore, but we also have had the CPA review into. Now, in the context of the Rapid Learning Initiative, um, and indeed the uh, the Chief Nursing Officer heading that up, and, and I suppose there are questions for me around that in terms of a lot of the issues within that settings were to do with regulatory issues, and we need to bear in mind that this is, these are people's homes, and that social care and social opportunity um, needs to be reflected. But how is the CPA report linking in with the Rapid Learning Initiative, and when is that report going to be published? Okay, I'll start with um, the point uh, about uh, the Rapid Learning Initiative and the relationship between healthcare and social care, uh, and then address CPA, and I'll ask Mark to um, uh, add to the current status of the CPA report. I think you're absolutely right, Chair, to point out that these are people's homes, um, and uh, uh, the Minister, Charlotte, myself, we have discussed this, and it's certainly not our intention to try and turn um, these facilities into subacute community health care facilities. That is not the intention. Um, and so there will certainly be social care and social work input to that rapid learning uh, review and the framework for increasing the health care support to those facilities. I think the uh, way that uh, uh, it's best thought of is that people should be uh, supported to live in their own home as long as possible and with uh, increasing level, levels of healthcare needs being met in that setting. Now, when I say their own home, that can be your private residential address, or it could be a residential home, or it could be a nursing home. The key is not to turn those into healthcare facilities, it is to provide the in-reach and support that enables you to stay living in those homes. So it's not about changing the character of homes and turning them into healthcare services. It's about providing in-reach that enables people to stay living there as long as possible. In terms in terms of uh, the findings of the CPEA work into uh, uh, Dunbarney Manor, uh, we have uh, some of those findings uh, with us at the moment. We've had them for fact-checking. Certainly, we'll make sure that those are available to the team uh, doing the rapid learning review. Uh, in terms of, I know definitely we've got the safeguarding uh, uh, paper for fact-checking. So the, um, we're expecting the, the, the CPA have done a, a number of papers on different issues. So one of the, the uh, furthest progressed is the one on safeguarding, which we're expecting a final version of very, very soon. Um, there's a, uh, a paper on handling complaints, uh, which we expect to start going through a fact-checking process very soon. And then we expect to receive one on regulation uh, for fact-checking in a not too distant future. So we'll continue to press CPEA to bring those reports to us as soon as uh, they possibly can. Their progress has obviously been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, so that we can draw the learning from those. But when you say as soon as possible, when, when could we expect to see actual reports published? Uh, I mean, to some extent, we're in the hands of CPA. who need to make sure that they are completely happy with their report to us. Um, I would hope that, certainly on the safeguarding one, that would be days rather than weeks. Yeah. Just, just to also uh, uh, point out that before CPA are sharing each of their reports with us, 
they have to have them cleared with the PSNI because you'll be aware that the PSNI investigation is a PSNI investigation to consider whether there are any criminal offences associated with what happened in Dunmurray Manor. And so they're, they're trying to make sure that the material in those reports doesn't compromise uh, any investigation or any potential prosecution. So that has added a degree of delay. Um, but I'd have to say I spoke to um, uh, the relevant uh, superintendent, I think within the past eight or nine days, uh, and was emphasising to him, and he fully accepted the need for us to be able to act on these as quickly as possible, as indeed they want to, because they have an interest in these reports beyond their investigation. Uh, safeguarding, um, in particular, is an activity which is one uh, jointly taken forward amongst many partners, and the police are critical to that, so they're very anxious to work with us to improve uh, adult safeguarding in Northern Ireland on the back of the information from the CPA report. Okay, and then finally for me before voting members, in relation to RQAA, what assurance can you give the public that there is a regulatory framework in place that provides safeguarding at a standard that, that is to the maximum and is, is world leading given the, the chaos in relation to this resignation? Um, what can you share in relation to what has led up to that resignation and what's being done about that and also about ensuring that we have a robust system in place? Okay. Um, the first thing uh, to say is that obviously the Minister has commissioned an independent review into the events that have led to the uh, regrettable resignation of the Board of the RQIA. And I'm not going to preempt the findings of that review or speculate as to what those findings are going to be. Um, what I would say is that the actual decisions um, uh, that, that, that seem to have started this chain of events related to the uh, uh, suspension of routine inspections. Um, and the uh, deployment of key staff uh, within the health and social care system. Uh, with the first of those issues, um, it was really important to try and minimise footfall in and out of care settings. Um, now, uh, minimise, not eliminate. So uh, some people have said, well, why did you stop the RQIA um, uh, going to visit these facilities while uh, a number of other people were going in and out of these facilities? Well, those other people were staff delivering care, um, and you can't stop that. If you, you know, that, that, that's not uh, within your gift in terms of uh, minimising. Whereas um, stopping inspectors moving from facility to facility, yes, that was deemed um, uh, by uh, the sponsors of the RQIA and the RQIA to be a reasonable step. What I would say is that uh, uh, when um, that was presented to me, I recognise that as being a step that was being taken um, by many other regulators in other jurisdictions. Certainly in these islands, um, I think every nation uh, took the same step. Um, uh, the uh, second point about the redeployment of staff, uh, certainly I think that uh, one of the most um, forceful messages I heard uh, uh, about the pandemic was from uh, one of the senior doctors in the World Health Organization who talked about the need for leadership and the need for people to take decisions uh, really quickly without always knowing that the decision was going to be entirely the right one, but moving quickly was paramount. Now, to do that, you need people um, uh, 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 of uh, uh, experience and calibre in the right positions. There was a judgment taken uh, that uh, um, uh, the chief executive of the RQIA uh, should lead the PHA, um, that um, uh, uh, the medical director in the RQIA would uh, support the department's clinical team in, in leading the response, and that uh, Dermot Parsons would become the acting chief executive of uh, uh, the RQIA. I, I, as I said, the ministers commissioned a review about how uh, those processes were handled and how they were dealt with with the board. All I would say is that in my experience of the past 13 weeks, I certainly appreciated and felt it was critical that there were senior people in those positions. Um, uh, myself and Mark certainly had very, very close uh, contact with the RQIA throughout that period um, and had uh, a phenomenal amount of access to and worked very collaboratively with Dermot 
um, uh, in that uh, role. Uh, and it never once occurred to me that we were uh, not experiencing um, a good service from that organisation because of those changes. Um, uh, and that's a subjective view, I mean, but certainly that, that's just my honest and sincere experience of the past few weeks. Worked incredibly closely with the RQIA. Dermot provided very effective leadership um, uh, in, in that time uh, in my dealings with them. Yeah, uh, worth just, if I can just add, Chair, obviously the um, the safeguarding framework is not dependent on the RQA's routine reviews to receive referrals. So care home staff, families, yeah. trust staff can make referrals if they are concerned about an individual and they think there is a safeguarding issue. That has continued to be the case. One of the things we've done, obviously, as uh, footfall from RQA inspectors has reduced um, where we've been providing uh, additional Health and Social Care Trust staff in two homes. Uh, they've been provided with some guidance and aid memoir for things to think about uh, and to consider uh, in terms of um, uh, safeguarding issues within care homes to make sure that they are uh, as alert as they can be to any issues uh, to, to try and um, balance the fact that, that routine inspections are, have not been going in, in the same way. Sorry, one final point to, to, to add to that is these were routine inspections. That did not mean that the RQIA weren't prepared to go out and inspect a facility where they had cause to believe that there were live issues. I'm sure before this session is over, uh, you will be asking about um, uh, Clifton Nursing Home. Uh, 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 that was an example where, during this period where routine inspections were suspended, the RQIA inspected that facility. OK, I'm going to go uh, across to Paula first. Um, thank you. Um, well, thanks very much. Just to pick up on that independent review um, into the RQIA board resignation, do you know who wrote the terms of reference for that um, investigation and also whether you can give us some insight as to how that appointment process took place so quickly, You know, just so we are assured of the independence that it's not necessarily marking our own homework? Yeah, I, I, I have to be um, very clear. Uh, the um, sponsorship of the RQIA uh, does not fall to me. Um, and I haven't been involved in any of that process at all. And my earlier comments, I'd have to say, were of our experience of working with those organisations through the pandemic. Um, but the uh, process uh, of uh, the uh, changes uh, to the RQIA's operation and now the process of the independent review don't fall within my remit. However, um, the Chief Medical Officer, I believe, is appearing before the committee next week um, uh, alongside the Minister, um, uh, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to, to, to clarify the points that you asked. So, just to clarify, so it would have been Minister and CMO level would have written the terms of reference? I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I wasn't involved in the process, but I'm sure that they will be able to provide an answer. I don't know, whether, I, I don't know who wrote the terms of reference. I haven't been involved in that at all. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, okay, so the second question really is, is around... I know you're here about talking about adult social care, but I, I just want to raise an issue that was raised me last night about looked after children. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, we see that they're restating parental contact, but um, there has been a delay in the guidance being issued for um, reconnecting with siblings. And I'm just conscious that obviously it's a very vulnerable group of people, um, and I would like to see those contacts being expedited as quickly as possible. So I would just like your intervention in that to bring that forward as quickly as possible. I will certainly check on the uh, status of uh, the guidance in relation to uh, contact and will write to you to update you about that. I would share with you, um, I, I think understandably an awful lot of focus has been on uh, the people who are most vulnerable to uh, severe physical consequences of, of the pandemic. But I think as time goes on, we're going to become increasingly aware of the impact on young people. Um, uh, People talk about sacrifice. Uh, I think that we don't properly understand the sacrifice young people have had to make throughout this. Um, uh, you know, I can't remember what I did between March and June two years ago, or five years ago, or nine years ago. But I can remember in 1979 what I did in those months when I was 16. Um, it's a really special time, and, and we've, we've turned it upside down for young people. And for young people who are in care, that's particularly the case. Uh, so I really think that uh, your, your question is well, well, well placed. Um, it is a priority for us to try and respond to the needs of these young people and contact as part of that. So yes, I'll write to you and I'll also be pursuing in advance the letter going to you to see where we're at with the guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, I'm going to go across then to Alex, Jerry and Colin and then I have other members indicating, but I should have uh, just uh, declared my own interest in terms of my previous role as a social worker and indeed the, the fact that I'm on a, on a break from one of the trusts. 
and hopefully a future role at some point. Chair. <laughs> well, we'll, see, we'll see if time allows. There's not a great deal of it at the present time. I know. Alex. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for the work you've been doing. I think it's important to get that on the record. Thank you. Um, my first question is to do with, you mentioned about the percentage of care home staff and residents who have been tested for COVID-19. Do you have figures for how many have actually had it on those tests? How many uh, uh, staff I... and residents? How many care home residents have been tested? No, no positive actually results. Had, actually, can, actually caught it. Actually had. Uh, I may not be able to put my fingers on them immediately. Um, I'm going to go on to another question while you do that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I mean, we do get returns, um, and certainly, uh, rather than sort of give you an inaccurate figure, we're more than happy to, to look at the data and write to you to confirm. Yes. Um, and that would be for both staff and residents? Yeah, yeah. Um, also, um, I'm curious about the effect on social workers. Um, um, from what I'm led to believe, there's been quite an increase in different types of abuse. So I'm wondering how the staff, the social workers, are coping with that extra demand. And I'm also keen to hear from you about uh, foster carers. Um, is there, has there been a problem with that because of COVID-19, being able to, to get foster carers? And how are you coping with that? Okay. Um, first point, uh, Chair recalled uh, 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 us talking at an early point in the progress of this pandemic. Unfortunately, even at that stage, you'll recall, Chair, that uh, we had, uh, looking to other countries, we had noted that there was indications that under lockdown conditions, abuse did increase, particularly domestic violence, uh, which in itself creates an abusive environment for children. Uh, but we also believe that uh, there would be evidence to say that certain kinds of uh, child abuse were at greater risk of happening. Um, it's not clear the extent of that, and particularly one area where intuitively and on the basis of our understanding of research, it's not unreasonable to assume that there may well have been an increase in familial sexual abuse. That is not something that's easy to ascertain in the short term, and it probably will be many years before we understand the impact of lockdown on that particular kind of abuse. But certainly, uh, uh, we, we knew that there was going to be uh, an increase in uh, abuse from the beginning. Now, initially, the referrals about children in need dropped substantially. Um, and again, that might sound uh, 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 contradictory with the idea that abuse was increasing, but uh, people's understanding and people referring and people identifying children as being vulnerable requires people to see and interact with children. And children were no longer at school, they were no longer in youth clubs, they were no longer engaging in a whole range of activities, they were in their houses. Um, and so referrals dropped. Now that picture has now changed and we're seeing a surge, uh, certainly an increase both in the number of children who are being placed on the child protection register and there has been an increase in the number of children coming into state care. So that's a consequence. That will um, undoubtedly have an impact on social workers um, who, I'd have to say, have done a, a, a fantastic job through this. And uh, at one stage, uh, we're beginning to get some uh, case studies and uh, some write-ups of some of the work that social workers have done. And I, I would hope to share that with the committee at some point in the future, because I think it, it, it's, it, it's good to share that kind of good practice and allow you to, to see it. Um, but I also would have to say staff from every discipline uh, have been impacted by this. And one of the challenges, along with all the many other challenges that I referenced in the opening statement, is how we provide self-care um, and supported care for staff. Uh, there are staff who are going to be uh, experiencing um, uh, certainly uh, uh, emotional turmoil and anxiety all the way through to people who I'm sure will meet the clinical definition for things like PTSD after this, this experience. Um, uh, our, one of the things that we're looking at in our recovery plans is how we uh, support those staff. Already we do have uh, helpline uh, support available and psychological support. We are developing a significant number of online resources to help uh, people uh, access uh, things uh, which will be of assistance to them in, in, in relation to that. 
The final part of your question was in relation to foster carers. I don't have up-to-date information about foster care, uh, the foster care position. However, I do know that foster care selection and recruitment uh, was suspended uh, through um, uh, uh, COVID-19. That, given that we were already under pressure for foster carers, is going to cause us difficulties. Um, uh, I think that uh, our response to that will need to be uh, multifaceted. We need to try and make sure that we have capacity in residential children's homes, although that's not ideal, uh, and our first preference is always for a foster care placement. Uh, the uh, second thing, though, is I think that we need to look at restarting very quickly family support services, because the most desirable um, uh, 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 outcome in this situation is to not to need to take a child into foster care in the first place, but to provide the support to a family that enables them to cope with whatever difficulties they're facing. Family support hubs did continue running in one form or another throughout uh, the pandemic. I think we need to turn our focus to how we uh, step up family support. Uh, and then finally, we need to look at how we uh, restart foster care uh, recruitment and selection, um, and that will be part of our recovery plan. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank, thanks, Sean. And I can always hear in this in, in this committee, so did you say, sorry, 7,000 hours um, were supplied? I think 17,000. 17,000. Yeah, 17, thank you. 000. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, in regards to the, the Murray Manor, I mean, obviously, the, the police investigation, as you're well aware, began in 2018. And I think you said there's been conversations um, ongoing. Um, uh, what part is the investigation at, um, and what what stage in terms of its present stage is it at at the minute in terms of the investigation, the police investigation around Dunmurray Manor, um, and as as the church would have indicated around the RKIA generally, uh, there's uh, there's been concerns raised, um, if not heavily criticised, uh, in Cherry Tree uh, around Dunmurray Manor, uh, serious questions over Murkhamore, obviously as well. Uh, and people, to be frank, see this week as just a calamity, uh, a calamity events this week with the entire board resigning. And I think nobody, certainly here or in the public, would dismiss the idea of the need for a robust and independent uh, organisation to inspect uh, health and social care. Um, but there are concerns over the lack of action over recent years or many years f from the RQA, RQIA, uh, and there's been occasions uh, people have commented to me uh, concerning that they're not truly independent of the department. So I'd like you to, to address those points. Uh, and just finally, when do you believe with uh, events not only of this week but over the last uh, number of years, when do you think we'll have a, a regulator in place uh, that people can trust, have faith in? Um, because people are, are truly scratching their heads, especially with events this week, and asking what's going on. Okay. Um, Jerry, you'll forgive me for my first answer, because I know it's a frustrating answer. Uh, all I can say about the police investigation is it's ongoing. Um, uh, although we liaise with the police uh, uh, about their investigation, it is about it in its most general terms. The police quite rightly don't discuss the operational detail of that investigation with us. Um, uh, and that's... Uh, it, important um, because they are investigating albeit an independent provider they're investigating part of the care system so I mean it would be inappropriate for them to share with me uh, details um, operational details of that investigation I do know it's been extensive and they've committed very significant resources to it um, uh, and uh, I hope that it will conclude um, uh, uh, as quickly as possible whatever the outcome is um, but but uh, the police will, would have to answer for, for the state of their, their, their investigation. In relation to the RQIA, I'd make a few points, and some of them are general and some of them are specific. The first one is a specific point, and I would echo the comments of the Minister. I think it was yesterday. While what has happened with the board is regrettable, there is no reason for that to have any impact on the day-to-day -day operation of the RQIA. And certainly, uh, uh, as I said earlier, myself and Mark have been working uh, more closely with the RQIA than any other previous time in my career through the pandemic, and um, uh, there, there has been uh, whatever has been happening with its board, uh, I have not experienced that in any way as impacting on the operation of that organisation. The third thing I would like to say goes back to a general point. Um, I think we need to be realistic about what we can expect from any regulator. This isn't a comment about the RQIA, but it's about any regulator of any system. Regulators do not guarantee um, the performance, the adequate performance of any system, whether they're regulating schools, healthcare, social care, uh, or, or whatever. They give you a snapshot insight into how uh, that organisational system is operating at a point in time. Um, ultimately, the responsibility 
for the effective operation uh, uh, of a service lies with the people who are providing that service. Um, uh, uh, and uh, in the case of care homes, those are the independent sector providers who provide. Um, what the regulator should be able to do is give us an insight as to how well or otherwise they're discharging those responsibilities, but not in a 100% fail-safe kind of way, because they go in on a day and they see what they see, um, and that's what they can report on. Unfortunately, the nature of abuse in particular is that it is almost by definition covert. Um, uh, so uh, it is something people seek to hide and conceal. Um, uh, and I think that uh, that's a challenge for any, any regulator. In relation to the RQIA's performance specifically, um, certainly the uh, work of CPEA is considering the role of regulation in regard to uh, the events at Don Murray Manor, and I look forward to seeing the report uh, uh, on that. I have not yet received it, but I'm sure that when that is available and when it's public, we, we will be able to answer that question. Um, uh, uh, more effectively. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? It's just perhaps worth saying that the department um, had already been carrying out review of regulatory policy um, to put in place a new regulatory uh, framework, uh, and we understand that a proposed policy document setting out the principles uh, is still intended to be issued for consultation later this year. Yeah, just, just finally, Chair, I think pe people I've been speaking to are, are concerned that uh, the police investigation uh, around the Murray Manor isn't, um, there isn't information coming about that, and they would uh, want a speedy resolution uh, to that. And I think the problem with, with investigation and investigatory bodies is the fact that concerns are often raised, and for the most part, nothing's really done. There's no uh, sanctions, there's no fines, and that's been a repeated action with uh, issues around RQA, and that's a concern that a lot of people have. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, go on to Colin now. Yeah, Chair, thank you very much indeed. Um, Chair, I suppose there might be a couple of observations. Um, you know, I've taken away note of some of the things that you've said here today. Um, I mean, you said that during the pandemic that the RQI provided safe and effective functions, and what has happened uh, won't impact the work of the RQIA. And I think maybe that could typify maybe what the problem with the board is, because what you're saying there is that you don't need a board to be able to do the work, and that what they did during the pandemic um, was, was proper and safe and effective, yet the board actually felt they had to resign because of what happened in that process. So, you know, I think as an observation, I really, it typifies to me that there are uh, relationship difficulties between the board and the department if um, those are the sort of remarks that are being made about the board. Um, I, if I was a member of that board, I, I would be taking that as a very insulting um, statements to say that they, they were grand uh, in what they did throughout the process and we don't really need you to be able to do the work. Now, I hope you can qualify those maybe to well, give I a bit do more, more than qualify. I would yeah, actually challenge them and I would rely on Hansard. I don't actually think that that is a reflection of what I've said. Um, I, uh, certainly in relation to uh, the operation of the RQIA uh, uh, not being affected by the resignation of the board, I was referring to a ministerial statement on that. And what mm -hmm. I believe he was referring to is the fact that uh, the day-to-day -day operation is not directed by a board. So a board uh, has a very, very important role. A board assures governance, it assures uh, challenge to the executive officers of an organisation, um, and it provides a degree of accountability back to the department uh, uh, for the running of an ALB. Um, uh, but they don't direct operational uh, activity. That isn't their job. I sit on a number of boards uh, as a non-executive director, and uh, it, it's always uh, um, emphasised to me um, uh, by the chairs who, who work on those boards that it is not our job to run the organisation. The role of a board is different to the role of executive officers, and I believe that's what the minister was referring to. In relation to the operation of the RQIA through the pandemic, I'm not giving a, a, a global assessment of the performance of the RQIA throughout the pandemic. I don't have that in information. Um, uh, I, I don't have that knowledge. All I'm saying is I worked very closely with them, uh, as did my colleague, and during those uh, 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 encounters, uh, they worked uh, very effectively with us. Um, and, and I'm happy to illustrate what 
what we're referring to. I mean, one of the key things um, for, for us through the pandemic was trying to get information about what was happening. Um, uh, 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 and I mean, this is always a challenge because on the one hand, you don't want to burden people with bureaucracy and filling in forms, particularly not when they're responding to a pandemic. But on the other hand, you need to have real time information to understand what is going on and how you can support a sector and how you can respond. The RQIA played a critical role in that. I mean, Mark can, can um, expand on this. We were able to get daily reports from care homes about how they were assessing themselves in terms of their staffing, in terms of outbreaks in terms of their access to PPE via the work of the RQIA. That's all I was commenting I, And what would, um, because some of the concern that I would have is that um, we had the former chief executive of the RQIA here, I think it was either the very end of April or the very beginning of May, I can't remember exactly which it was, and at that we challenged uh, some of us about the visitations that were taken in homes. We then asked for a breakdown of the visits that have taken place, and from that meeting that we had with the former chief executive, that is what happens to the visits in the homes. They should up, away up. The major we've got the list of dates broken down, and we can see that there was a series of remote visits and a handful of inspections. But as soon as we raised that question, then all of a sudden the numbers increased. And that makes me suspicious. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have a suspicious mind, but that makes me suspicious that once we challenge something, then all of a sudden. And if we take, for example, you had mentioned about Clifton, and there was quite a detailed a spotlight investigation into that, that any of the interactions with them all took place post any of the issues that we were raising in this committee about RQIA. There were the visitations all took place during May, uh, and nothing during March and April. So whenever the department asked the RQIA to stop doing the, the visitations and they went to remote, uh, sometimes remote uh, uh, sort of in investigations, what was involved in a remote investigation that would be different from a on-site investigation? And you know, were you satisfied that if there were a series of homes where there were issues, it was a remote exercise able to help and able to prevent people from dying, which they inevitably did in some of those homes? Okay. Um, in terms of the profile, well, the, the first thing I have to make it clear, and this isn't a case of trying to avoid the question, it's just I'm not best placed to answer some aspect of your question. I'm not the sponsor within the department for the RQIA, um, and some of these questions I think need to be answered by the RQIA and their sponsor. Uh, but what I would say in relation to the profile of visits, I'm not sure exactly of the dates, but I think it's probably inevitable that as the course of the pandemic has changed, the profile of visits may change. So um, uh, you know, sort of you'll be more cautious at the height of a pandemic uh, uh, as community transmission reduces. You may feel, and I'm nervous here because I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak on behalf of other people who, who can answer these questions for themselves. Um, so that, that, that may be a, a factor in terms of the visits. In relation to uh, Clifton, um, it should be noted that they did conduct boots on the ground visits uh, before the lift of um, the routine uh, um, uh, prohibition of doing inspections. So uh, it was still within the period when routine inspections were not happening, where there was identified a need, they did conduct frequent visits um, in, 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 into Clifton House. So that happened. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, yeah, well, not during March or April, but all, all post, yeah. whenever we had yeah. raised issues here, then the visits did happen, then they found the issues. And the reason that I was asked some of those questions is RQIA wrote to us and they've named you as the person that it says that the Chief Social Workers' Correspondence to Care Homes on the 17th of March recognised the risk. So they're actually detailing that they changed a lot of their procedures based on correspondence from you. So that I know you're, you're saying you're not their sponsor, but they're clearly saying that, unless maybe they mean somebody else in that, but that's... If you share the correspondence with me, I'll, I'll be able to clarify that point. Yeah. OK. Thank you, Chair. OK. Thank you. One across to Pat. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Thanks, uh, Sean and Mark, for coming in. Um, I want to go back to the question Paul asked you at the start around the review of the uh, the RQIA, the independent review that's been established. And um, I'm just wondering if you're if you're aware if the department or the PHA 
commissions any services from the individual that has been appointed to head this up? Um, I can't answer that with 100% certainty. I don't know the gentleman, um, and I've never uh, had any direct dealings with the organisation. And as I say, I didn't set the terms or wasn't party to the selection. However, I, I am aware that uh, I am fairly certain that On Board is an organisation who provide training to prospective non-executive directors across a range of organisations. And I would imagine that has included. Uh, um, uh, people um, who are going on to boards of arms length bodies uh, sponsored by the department. I, I, I would suspect that's the case, but I would need to double check and say I, I've never had any contact with the organisation myself. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. And just moving on then, uh, in terms of hospital admissions from care homes, uh, we saw a drop of almost a third from February to March, and then another drop of a third from March to May, uh, and th th this isn't just individuals, it's a number of admissions. It shows a considerable drop in admissions to hospital from care homes, uh, and what would you put that down to, considering that we've heard if someone needs admitted to hospital, they're going to be admitted? Mm -hmm. uh, I my answer would be speculative at the moment. I think it's one of the things that we need to analyse the data, and uh, I think people with clinical expertise beyond mine as a social worker would probably be critical to helping us understand uh, the, the, the situation. I think that um, there is always a desire to try and make sure uh, that people who are at the end of life aren't moved. One of the big challenges over the past number of years has been uh, the number of people who die in hospital who probably shouldn't die in hospital. They should be able to die in their own home or in a care home. Um, and I think that it may well have been related to palliative care, but I don't know. Um, uh, I think certainly uh, that uh, where possible, uh, you're trying to avoid as much movement around the system as possible. So where you could care for people where they are, that's what you should be doing. But uh, I really would, I mean, Mark, if you can add to that. I mean, it is difficult to say without a kind of systematic look. Certainly I'm aware that a number of trust uh, increased their in reach into homes in terms of making geriatricians available or others to provide support directly into the homes. It's sort of like a, an enhanced acute care at home service or enhanced care at home service that a number of the trusts already, already run. So I think a, a change in the way um, uh, acute care was provided to try and avoid people needing to come into hospital and provide that as far as possible in homes would account for some of those changes, perhaps, I would suggest. But we need, we need a systematic look at it to be to fully understand all of the drivers and to what extent uh, they were important in that, that, that change in those numbers. You see, some people would argue that decisions were being made that certain patients wouldn't qualify, for example, to be put on ventilators. Uh, and, and if those were particularly frail or elderly uh, people, maybe with comorbidities, comorbid that decision would have been taken on site in a nursing home, uh, and therefore people wouldn't have been uh, admitted to hospital. But I, I'm just throwing that out. You're saying you don't have... Uh, well, what, I, what I'd respond to that is to say that the decision about any course of treatment is made by a clinician who's supervising the care of uh, an individual. There certainly was never any decision at a policy level um, to uh, restrict uh, uh, people's access to certain kinds of treatment, nor could there ever be in that kind of sense. I think we do, we do have some figures around the number of um, admissions no, to hospital no, but there, for COVID. There is, Sean, I mean, forgive me, there is, if you've only one ventilator and you've two patients who need mm. ventilated, I mean, decisions are made on that basis. They're not necessarily made on, on a clinical basis, although obviously there's a clinical input. But the fact that there's only one ventilator, someone loses out. Well, those would be decisions of prioritisation made by clinicians who were overseeing the resource available to them against the demand in front of them. And we never reached that point. And we never reached that point. You see, it, it comes back to the issue that you raised about uh, the acute hospitals. And, and sorry, you raised the issue yourself that we saw acute hospitals being overwhelmed in Italy and Spain and parts of France. But we, we also uh, saw care homes and the elderly being disproportionately affected in those same countries, yet there didn't seem to be any sort of real action taken here to deal with that particular issue. 
I would dispute that. I think there were a number of actions. Um, uh, I mean, I, I recall uh, the point at which um, we stepped up uh, the response to um, the threat of a pandemic uh, in the department, and that was the day when uh, we started uh, activating plans in, relations to, in relation to acute hospitals. That was the same day we started asking ourselves what did we need to do to support uh, care homes in the event of a pandemic. Um, it wasn't the case that one started and then we got round to the other subsequently. Um, uh, there, there, there was a focus from the beginning. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, PPE. Um, the decision was made at a very, very early stage, before uh, care homes were being impacted uh, by, by COVID directly. We recognised that there was going to be a need for PPE in the care homes. Now, care homes have a responsibility to provide PPE. They use it every day of the year anyway. But we recognised that there was a risk that they would be overwhelmed um, uh, because we knew that there was a risk that this, this would spread to care homes and there was particular vulnerability. So we took a decision very, very early on in uh, the, the planning to say that trusts needed to consider care homes as if they were part of their own organisations when it came to allocating PPE to them. Um, so, I mean, whether we were as effective as we wanted to be, whether it worked as well as we hoped, whether the virus behaved in ways that we didn't fully understand, whether we properly or didn't properly learn the lessons from other countries, I don't know. Um, others will be the judge of that, I'm sure, no doubt about that. But it certainly wasn't the case that we forgot about them. Um, we, we started uh, planning at the same time as we did for the acute sector. You, you've, men you've mentioned the plan a couple of times there, Sean, and we have saw seen the surge plans that yeah. were published for the hospitals. Can you provide the committee with the plan for care homes at that point? The plan in relation to care homes was incorporated in the trust plans. Um, we, we, we received a... Um, uh, adult and children's social care surge plan from the Health and Social Care Board. I think on the 13th of March, we, we commissioned in, a, in the kind of early stages of March, and that came back to us then. I'm sure we can we can find that and provide that to you. It's, it's worth saying the focus at that point really was on freeing up staff to respond to the surge. So it was really about yeah. saying how how can we get staff free, ready to respond to where we need to respond. I mean, in the early days, I, I do recall that was one of our primary focuses because we recognised that. Um, uh, in the event of a pandemic, well, firstly, we know that we run our system, I mean, the phrase we use, it, it runs very hot. So uh, we talked earlier about, you know, we've underfunded this system um, uh, and we extract an awful lot of value. So we knew that this was a fragile system and we recognised that one of the particular risks would be if we had significant numbers of staff becoming sick, how would we continue to run a service? So the early surge plans, that was a particular focus, although I'd say PPE was also a very early focus for it. But in relation to so you've, that, that plan apparently deals with freeing up staff. The plan that I asked you about on the 5th of March, Sean, when I said what is, it, what is the plan to protect care homes and the people within them, can that plan be shared with us? There was guidance issued uh, for including care homes on the 27th of February and then again on the, I think the 13th of March was the next version, and then a, a further version specifically for care homes, guidance to them on, I think, the 17th of March. So that was the kind of flow that, you know, that, that guidance is the plan. This is what we, we want care homes to do and trusts to do. Was, was there a structured plan? That, that guidance set out clearly what we believed uh, different parts of the system should do, how they should behave in the future. Okay. That constitutes a plan. Can you get that guidance to us? Do we get a look yeah. at that just to see how that pops across? OK, I'm going now to the phone there to Orlea. Uh, yes, Gormiel, good chair. Um, thanks to Sean and, and Mark. Uh, my first question is around the care homes, and I was just wondering, I know that I've been getting lobbied, I'm sure a lot of the other members have as well, just around the visiting rights for families in the care homes, and are you aware if there's any legal standing in turning away a family or a carer wanting to visit um, their loved one in a care home? And then just the second part of that question, is there any update on the funding um, reaching the sector for the use of the tablet devices in, in care homes, um, if it is a case that their families can't, can't visit for um, a great while yet. Thank you. Okay. Um, the position of, of visiting is ultimately for each individual care home, um, uh, for them to determine what their visiting policy is. However, we have referred to it in guidance and we've said 
Um, and I'll look to Mark as the person who drafted a lot of this guidance for the uh, more accurate description. But basically, we've said that you need to take a risk-based approach um, and that you need to be uh, very conscious of infection control measures. Um, we recommend that you absolutely minimise uh, footfall in and out of uh, care homes during the pandemic. Now, that is obviously uh, the position that was reflective of where we were at uh, when we were seeing more significant community transmission. Currently, uh, I believe there is a group um, generally looking at visiting policies who are, are reviewing that position now as we move into the next stage, um, uh, but I need to be updated on the work uh, uh, of that group. In relation to uh, the funding package, yes, the last funding package the Minister announced um, uh, included, I think it was £2.2 .2 million pounds that was specifically for equipment. Now, some of that equipment was uh, of a clinical nature, so it was to provide um, uh, additional things uh, to enable people to monitor oxygen levels, um, uh, to make sure everyone had adequate uh, thermometers of an appropriate type. But we also said that that uh, fund could be used to access um, equipment that facilitated uh, the contact between relatives and residents, um, and I think we specifically referenced uh, tablets. Now, we're currently, uh, at the Minister's uh, instruction, looking at opening up that uh, resource to also being uh, uh, available to care homes where they want to purchase equipment that might facilitate face-to-face uh, visitation, but we want to make sure that that is only supported where there is evidence to say that this is a safe arrangement. Um, so we're doing a little bit of work with our colleagues in the PHA at the moment, um, but we do hope that uh, that money will be uh, able to support care homes. I mean, I'm sure, like myself, you've seen um, uh, some innovations from other places uh, uh, who are maybe at a different stage uh, in, in their pandemic journey to us, and they're, they're uh, further along in terms of looking at innovative ways of facilitating contact. Um, I mean, I've seen sort of like perspex boxes in the grounds of homes, uh, different uses of screens, tunnels, and what have you. Um, we're certainly uh, interested in, in those ideas and do not have a problem in principle to the equipment money supporting uh, those, but we do want to check with colleagues in the PHA that they are actually a good idea uh, and that they, they, they don't carry additional risks. Mark? Yeah, so just the, the guidance obviously refers to uh, nursing residential, residential homes implementing the existing policies they would use if there was an infection control issue at their home. So as Shauna said, this is guidance from, from us to them about implementing uh, existing uh, approaches just as they would if there was an outbreak of vomiting and diarrhoea or whatever it may be. Um, uh, and as uh, Sean said, we're um, uh, chasing up to see uh, progress on the, the disbursement of that 11.7 million uh, at the minute to see how far we've got in, get, in getting that out the door. I think it's, it's important to note, I mean, we've done, this is the second tranche of funding, but they've been very different in their nature. So the first 6.5 million Correct, yeah. um, was a very straightforward uh, arrangement to disperse money because we recognise people needed money quickly. Um, and so it was a, a grant system. And based on the number of beds, you would get uh, either 10, 15 or 20,000 pounds. Now that's a very simple arrangement. All you have to do is uh, specify how many beds you've got and bang, you've got the money. Uh, this money is slightly different. It has to be against spend. It has to be accounted for. Um, and I think it's appropriate that at a stage in the pandemic, we loosened uh, arrangements and tried to look at a very speedy way of dispersing money. I think as we've moved on, it's appropriate that we make sure that the money is being more targeted and can be accounted for. Uh, and we're not simply throwing money um, at facilities to use for whatever they need. So the spend will be slower for this than it was for the original trial. Based on okay. a claim back. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, and don't underestimate the job that you have in front of you, as do all the health and social care workers in the system. Uh, very under pressure. Um, in terms of that, the group you said that we're looking at the visitation, is there a name for that group? Uh, no, it's just a group within the department. So colleagues from the, the chief nursing officers group uh, uh, and from our team have been been looking at that together and engaging with experts in the PHA and others think about what, what that new guidance on this thing should say. Yeah, okay. It's just that I think it was Pauline Shepherd, I think it was told the committee that uh, an average stay in a, in a care setting is just eighteen months. Uh, and given that and given where we are in the pandemic um, and what may or may not come in the future, but regardless whether it does or not, that risk is there. 
Uh, so the pressure is on to protect the most vulnerable in society. Um, but you know, how do you how do you balance that with the need for visitation, which is it is incredibly vital. And, and I don't know how. And I, I'm thinking in terms of older people who have all their faculties and are actually uh, relatively well and, and to some degree, and um, contrasting that with with those who might be very confused with medical conditions which um, leave them in a really bad place because they cannot see um, their loved ones and, the, and, their, and their friends. Mm -hmm. so I'm just very anxious to see some kind of resolution. I know it's very difficult, but I'm very anxious to see some kind of resolution. I understand that it often it's up to individual homes, and some yeah. homes are doing different things to allow that to happen because they, they recognise and they want the best for the residents. But I think we need to find a solution. We need to find it Quickly. very, very urgently because, um, you know, Lives could be lost simply to the loneliness and confusion. Um, I, I think your point is really, really, really well made and it illustrates a few issues. One is sometimes you're looking for the least worst decision. Um, and there is a balance here between you know, recognising the importance of, of family contact against the absolute imperative of trying to protect an incredibly vulnerable... I mean, as the questions have demonstrated quite rightly, you know, we know this is a really vulnerable community. And it, 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 I think we need to also we, we need to recognise that we're still learning about the nature of this virus in terms of how it behaves and the speed with... I mean, because the majority of care homes have not had an outbreak. A number of care homes which did have an outbreak have recovered, have, have, have come back. Some care homes have been devastated by an outbreak, and, and we need to get to understand all of that. But your point about you know, sort of elderly people, actually the minister, I recall, made this point at one of his press conferences, um, I, I, and it reflected an irritation I also felt that sometimes there was a point early on in the pandemic when people were talking about who was dying and who was surviving. And you kept on hearing, so sort of four people died, but they all had underlying health conditions or they were all elderly. And it was almost as if, well, that doesn't count in the same way. And I remember the minister trying to make the point that you don't measure the value of a life in terms of time. You know, uh, the fact that someone might be relatively close to their death as opposed to being a, a young person in their 20s, that's not how you measure the value of a life. And often the last months of a life, uh, as, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're the time when uh, people reconcile, you know, issues that have been going on in families for generations, for, 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 for years. It's the time when people make peace. It's valuable time. So we take your point. Uh, we, we, we'll make sure that uh, appropriate impetus is given to the, the work around visiting, absolutely. I appreciate that. And just my, my last uh, question is around the pressure that um, social work in particular is, is under. And, and you said at the start in your presentation that, you know, that basically things will not be returning to normal anytime soon. Um, any change in social distancing measures, i.e. one metre to say, or two metres to one metre, mm -hmm. would that have a positive impact on services and would that allow some service to resume? Uh, yes, it probably will uh, certainly facilitate some services. I mean, the services where I think social distancing present a particular challenge um, uh, include uh, daycare settings, um, where obviously you've got a fixed amount of space and you're trying, trying to provide a service to a fixed number of people. Um, uh, and so uh, social distancing has an, ability, uh, an impact on your ability to operate. So a move from uh, very much like the hospitality sector, I mean, where I've heard people describe the difference between two metres and one metre as being the difference between being able to operate at 30% capacity and 70% capacity, a similar uh, impact would be uh, on things like daycare settings on the basis of, of, of social distancing. I think um, regardless of what the rule is about social distancing, the reality about the presence of the virus in the community has an impact on how safely you can do uh, certain things that in involve direct contact. We've talked about domiciliary care. Well, that's continued and people have received, uh, and, and working care homes, there's been direct physical contact throughout. But there are other situations where um, you know, being physically close to someone is important. Um, I was talking to uh, the um, outgoing uh, chair of the Royal College of Psychiatry and the incoming chair of the Royal College of Psychiatry uh, two days ago, and we were talking about the um, uh, need to innovate and use uh, technology 
um, for remote working as being a way of managing uh, the challenge of social distancing. And they were saying, yes, there are definitely opportunities, but remember, there are some services we provide that are about a relationship, and a relationship is developed not simply through the words we say, but being in the same physical space with each other, that contact, that ability to read people's behaviour. So I think the, 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 the less restrictions we have, um, the more you can facilitate that building of a relationship with people, which is a key part of an awful lot of social work activity as well. Absolutely. And just supplementary to my last question there then, um, in terms of um, uh, children that are at risk, uh, you talked about you know, the outworking of the pandemic and the, the rising figures of children that are at risk, um, and you're dealing with that. But obviously, if our children are back in school, and I mean all of them, and uh, as normal as possible, and we're seeing evidence that the children are much less at risk than, than, than adults and older people, the, this virus. Uh, but surely, um, if you can, you can reduce to, to one metre social distancing for schooling, would so I'd better be careful, I don't ask you something that's too scientific, it's not your place, but what's your opinion around maybe um, the balance between getting children back to school regardless of social distancing because of um, the other risks yeah. there are in this life to them, uh, which, it, which is I, not the virus? I would say that the decision on uh, what a safe distance is not one for me to make. Uh, and I defer to uh, my medical and scientific colleagues to make that determination. They will provide advice and uh, decisions will be made on the basis of that advice. I think that those decisions uh, need to take into account that advice. They also need to take into account uh, the, the, the advice that would say that social interaction is incredibly important as part of children's development. Uh, it can have a lifelong impact on them long beyond childhood. Also, that schools are incredibly protective. Um, uh, I, I'm old enough to remember a time when the relationship between social workers in child protection and schools was not always necessarily a close one. That is not the case today. Schools and child protection services are absolutely intertwined and in integrated. Every school has teachers who are specialist, well-trained, safeguarding uh, officers in their schools. The fact that children are at school is a hugely protective factor. So I think that there are risks and dangers associated with keeping children away from school one day longer than is absolutely necessary, but it has to be balanced with, with those other factors. Thank you. And is it also a factor that while children are, don't appear to be as susceptible to developing the disease, they're quite capable of spreading it to their older loved ones who are? I make it a point, um, uh, myself and uh, the chief medical officer, he doesn't practice social work, I don't practice medicine. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll Luckily, he's coming. He is. Coming very soon. So we'll address that. Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark and Sean, for your attendance today. Uh, Sean, if I picked you up right there, you were talking in your uh, opening remarks about uh, the testing program, the project of testing all the uh, residents and staff in, in the, the nursing care sector, and you indicated that you hope to have that process finished by the end of this month. So it's obviously been a huge task, and I think I recognised that from day one, just how huge a task it was. Um, is this a one-off, or uh, is there an intention for a second tranche uh, to start again uh, when this one finishes? And I know that the Commissioner for Older People uh, is on record uh, suggesting to the committee here that he would like to see testing done actually twice a week. Um, would that be deliverable? Would it be practicable uh, for that to happen? Um, in terms of, uh, I know you've alluded to it there in Palm's question, but the committee received a very touching letter there just a couple of weeks ago from a member of the public saying what steps have been taken to enable care homes to open their doors to family members for visiting, even in a managed, contained way. Elderly residents in many care homes have been confined in their rooms for 11 weeks. The family have been banned from entering the home apart from one hour near end of life. The effect this is having on these elderly people in the closing weeks and months of their life really, really is extremely upsetting. And I know that you have, you've, you've talked about it and mentioned it. Um, but last night there was a, a, an item on TV, I don't know, it was the Ulster Television or BBC. I saw the item. I, I saw the item. Yeah. 
where they had innovated. And it was really quite a, a, a cheap option, just a, a wheel-in screen that was brought into the room. And, and the joy on the faces both of the residents and of the, of the family was, it was a joy to behold. Um, it is somebody sort of looking at those options and coordinating them and trying to encourage the nursing homes? Or is it down to money? Okay, um, I'll and start just, with the, the other. Uh, the other point, just to put on the record, yeah. I welcome uh, your uh, uh, reassurance uh, today that the RQIA, uh, the routine work of it, is continuing, and I think families with a family member in the care sector uh, will welcome that reassurance this morning. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I'll start with the um, screens and, and, and visiting. I'll not repeat the points that we've already made about the importance of it. But uh, no, it's not a question of money because, as I say, the minister explicitly said to me he wanted to make sure that the uh, 2.2 million resource for equipment was available to care homes to deliver that kind of innovation. Um, as long as uh, we, our colleagues um, in uh, the PHA, advised that that was a suitable. So we're, 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 we're working on that. I, I saw the item as well, and you're right, it was very, very touching. Um, and back to the points that Pam made and my responses to her. You know, the, the time is really, really precious. We take that on board. Um, we hope to uh, have new uh, uh, information about visiting very shortly. Uh, in relation to um, the uh, um, testing uh, program, uh, and I'm aware of the the, 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 the position of uh, the, the the commissioner. Um, like me, uh, the commissioner is not a scientist or a qualified medical practitioner. Um, I understand where he's come from, and I understand what he's uh, hoping to achieve. Um, uh, and it, it, at an intuitive level, it, it certainly makes uh, some sense. But what will happen is that this programme of testing will be completed. Um, the results of that will then be considered by the scientific advisory group that has been established and that reports to the chief medical officer. And the chief medical officer will then provide advice to the minister as to what we should do next in relation to testing. Um, uh, and that'll be the process. What the outcome of that will be, I can't predetermine, but it will be based on the advice from the scientific advisory group. Uh, to the Chief Medical Officer is my understanding of the process. Is that correct, Mark? Right. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you both Mark and Sean for your attendance here today, for your presentations. Um, I suppose we do want to acknowledge the very uh, significant amounts of work that have been done in the care home in the care home setting. I think unfortunately today we didn't get to domiciliary care, such are the concerns around care homes. But we would all acknowledge that that, that good work that has been done and, and the many steps that have been taken. Um, I think on behalf of the committee we would like to extend our thanks to each and every one of the members who work under your directive, Sean, in terms of the social work that the domiciliary care workers, all of those people who are on the front line throughout the, the worst and, and the most difficult stages of this pandemic in very difficult circumstances. Um, so I think that it's, it's obviously something that the, the in relation to the care homes and the lessons learned and how we can do things better in the care homes in the future is the key focus yeah. of the committee and that's what we want to continue to work on and that's the context of our questioning and I'm sure we will, we will be speaking to you again in, in, in that context. But thank you for today and all the best with your, your important work in, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I just make one uh, closing remark? It's not directly related to the business that we've uh, uh, been dealing with today, other than to say that we recognise that there are going to be mental health consequences um, to, to the pandemic. Um, uh, mental health issues are dear to uh, uh, many uh, politicians' hearts, quite rightly so. Um, and we've moved from a time when uh, people felt that having uh, um, mental illness was something that was uh, to be kept secret and to be ashamed of. A key thing in changing that has been uh, the willingness of people uh, in visible positions to stand up and acknowledge their own difficulties, and uh, that includes politicians. I'm eternally grateful to those who do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, that, I think, is, is well said, and I think we all would endorse that, that remark. Um, very, very much. Thank you, Sean and Mark. All the best. Okay, members. We uh, and Alex, go ahead. Apologies, but I have to go. <laughs> okay. Yep, that's fine. We we are going to take a short break, members. Now, just to get the next panel in on the line. So, could I suggest we're back at five past twelve? Or do you want to come back at twelve and try to get it? Twelve. One. 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 Even. One. Is it one now? It's, yep. Okay. <laughs> one o'clock, members. We'll try to get. Yeah. Thank you. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Thank you, members. We're, we're now going to resume, and this section is a, a further work on our COVID-19 disease response. And we're going to receive a presentation in relation to issues affecting dentistry and the impact of COVID-19 on that sector. I refer members to the papers at tab nine of the pack and tab nine of your table papers. I can inform members that representatives from the British Dental Association and the British Association of Private Dentists (NI) are here today to brief the committee on the impact of COVID-19 on dental services and the restoration of services. So, can I now welcome via teleconference Ms. Caroline Lappin, chairperson of the BDA? Are you there, Caroline? I am indeed. Thank you, Mr. Richard Graham, chairperson of NI Dental Practice Committee. Are you there, Richard? Yes, chair. Uh, Mr. Tristan Kelso, Director of the BDA NA. You there, Tristan? I am. And I think we have been joined by Ms. Paula McHenry, Committee Member of the BAPD. Are you there, Paula? Yes, I am. Yes, OK. So I just re would remind all members of the panel to uh, let us know who it is that is speaking when you're doing a presentation or addressing a question, just for information in the room. And also that you would keep your phone on mute when you're not contributing to the to the session, and also just keep the phone up. Uh, use headphones if possible. It helps with the clarity and feedback. So I'd like to go ahead now and invite witnesses to make opening remarks. And I think we're going to hear from Richard first from BDA and then Paula from BAPD. So go ahead, Richard, please. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the Health Committee for giving us this opportunity to appear before you today. As a trade union and professional body, the British Dental Association is the voice of dentists and dental students in the UK. We represent all crafts of dentistry in Northern Ireland and are recognised by the government to negotiate on behalf of general dental services and community dental services terms and conditions of service. Since we last appeared before the committee, dentistry, specifically the absence of routine care, has been very much brought to the fore of the public mind. There has been unparalleled disruption of dental services as a result of the coronavirus. In March, routine dentistry was suspended and practitioners were instructed to cease all aerosol generating procedures. Urgent dental care centres were quickly established to provide emergency dental care and we moved to a situation of emergency and urgent care only. However, it is important to stress that dental practices have remained open seven days a week throughout the pandemic, providing patients, including unregistered patients, with telephone triage, the three A's, which are advice, analgesia and antibiotics, and referrals to the urgent dental centres. I would like to pay tribute to the immense effort by community dental service colleagues working alongside volunteers from the general dental services and hospital dentistry and the leadership of the acting CDO, Michael Donaldson, to establish the five urgent care centres as COVID restrictions were imposed. It showed a profession that is dedicated to caring for its patients, even in the most restrictive of circumstances. Dentists have risen to this challenge during COVID. There has been more collaboration across the range of services in these past months in maintaining a level of patient care than perhaps ever before. Dentists have donated their own paid for PPE and oxygen cylinders to the cause. They have redeployed to apply their considerable skills in infection control and worked in community pharmacies and care homes, as well as extending cover to include weekends and non-registered patients. They have truly risen to this challenge. And yet, community dentists who have worked these longer hours on the front line in care homes and other settings still await confirmation that they will be paid for this. The department has taken months to confirm a temporary regional rate of pay. This follows on from dentists still waiting to receive their pay uplifts for 2019-20, and the feeling that the profession is often last in the line damages the morale and goodwill of the profession. In our letter to the Minister on the 4th of June, we appealed to the Department for much needed clarity in relation to three key areas. Firstly, time scales for the phased recovery of general dental services. Second, ongoing financial support after the initial three months financial support scheme expired in June, and three, help with PPE. On time scales, as of last week, GDPs have now been furnished with the dates for the phased recovery of general dental services. Phase two will allow dentists to provide non-urgent care from the 29th of June. 
Phase 3 will see the return of routine dental care and provision of aerosol-generated procedures and is scheduled for the 20th of July. There is also a fast-track option of the 1st of July for practices can demonstrate they can comply safely. On PPE, we welcome that in the CDO's letter of the 18th of June, the Department has acknowledged that PPE is a significant and necessary enabler in the move to restore dental services, and that the CDO is working alongside officials in the Department of Health to agree how PPE support will be provided. The Health and Social Care Board press release goes slightly further, stating that the Department of Health will support dentists in restoring services but providing help with PPE supplies. The clock for re-establishing services is ticking. The profession needs clarity urgently on what PPE will be available as they seek to be ready. On the financial situation facing dental practices through the dental, or Department of Health Financial Support Scheme, many practitioners have been provided a vital lifeline of continued financial support based on the continuation of their health service earnings albeit abated by 20%. This week, the Department of Health has confirmed that support under the initial first phase of the scheme will continue into July and August. As members will know, the profession has had to fight extremely hard to secure the financial supports that are now in place. Combined with the loss of private income to mixed practices and the inability of mainly private practices being able to access significant support, the financial viability of the entire dental sector has been on the balance like never before. Not all Bennett practitioners have benefited equally. Under Phase 1 of the FSS, we know of 26 female dentists who, because of maternity leave during the 2018-19 reference period, have received payments they feel are considerably lower than had they not been off on maternity leave. Those practitioners have been left feeling disadvantaged discriminated against even, and as yet, the majority of these cases remain all unresolved. We thank the committee for its efforts, but this issue requires a resolution and quickly. Looking ahead, we remain, ex remain extremely concerned at what could happen after August, particularly as the Department has fired warning shots that future support will have to be subject to the confines of the dental budget. The point we want to make today is this. So long as COVID restrictions are with us, dental practices will be unable to return to normal activity levels. A return to an item of service activity based contract model without continuation of government support would decimate dental practices and with it the future of healthcare dentistry in the general dental services. At this time of great uncertainty and anxiety, rather than alarming practitioners with talk of budget constraints, there is an onus on the Department of Health to give practitioners the assurance they will do whatever it takes to get them and in turn dentistry through this crisis intact. We also call for the Department of Health to initiate a genuine conversation about the shape of the GDS remuneration model that will apply from September on. We believe there is an opportunity to use the COVID experience for a radical rethink of dental services here rather than a system that is treatment-based and essentially pays for failure, we could take the opportunity to design a model that delivers oral health improvements. That would mean moving beyond an approach that counts widgets to free up practitioners to apply their skills to improve oral health outcomes and apply effective prevention across the life course, departing from an outdated, decades-old activity-based system. The vision we have would require an updated policy framework that is based on prevention as opposed to treatment. We have been calling for a new oral health strategy for years with the rebuild of the HSC services post-COVID, now is our chance. The BDA is committed to working with all stakeholders on this, especially the acting CDO, practitioners, academics and policy makers. Our oral health challenges in Northern Ireland are immense. 23,000 baby teeth were extracted by the Community Dental Services under general anaesthetic in 2017-18, and over 940,000 teeth were filled in over 380,000 patients, which represents 20.6% 20, 20 of the population in 2019-20. Surely we can do better than this. The new departure would also require adequate representation of dentistry at a senior level within the Department of Health. 
that must include the acting CEO having a seat at the new management board being established so that dentistry is both represented and its particular issues and scale factored into the important task ahead of rebuilding health and social care services. Under initial proposals, that is not the case, a case which we objected to in our response to the framework proposals. As we look ahead, we are concerned the oral health of the elderly, particularly those living in care homes and shielding, will deteriorate considerably during COVID. We remain concerned that waiting lists for child general anaesthetic instructions have soared upwards and that we do not yet have a regional solution to place, in place to deal with this. We are concerned that referrals for urgent head and neck cancer follow-up has reduced by approximately 50% and other specialist hospital dental services are currently unavailable to the patients who need them most. The most vulnerable in society will be impacted the most, widening existing inequalities and impacting quality of life. COVID has given us a timely reminder of the importance of an approach that prioritizes prevention and not treatment. More than ever, oral health matters. Years of rating the GDS budget for other priorities a 6.8 million underspend in general dental services in 2019-20 alone, or 19.1 million over five years from 2015 to 2020. The deprioritizing of oral health, overlooking oral health is important to general health and undervaluing the immense contribution over dentists make within the HSC has got to come to an end. Health service dentistry, general, community, hospital, dental services must feature prominently in the health and social care rebuilding plans. We have an opportunity to do things differently and better. If the committee will indulge me, I receive emails, texts and calls from dentists daily. This is an email I received yesterday and it shows the worry and frustration of the profession better than I ever could. Richard, I really don't know where this is going to end. It's obvious the Department of Health don't want to support NHS dentistry anymore. The way they're issuing these bitty letters with no solid financial framework for the future. It has just been mental torture. With us all bending over backwards and doing everything that's being asked of us and more. I'm so tired of it all. The situation is going from bad to worse. I can't see a way forward at the moment. We were making a loss before this and I was hanging on to the hope it would pass soon. Even 80% was not enough to pay the overheads. It just kept staff paid and banks from the door. There's just not the capacity to work as we did. It's impossible. I'd say we've spent about £3,000 on PPE, and that won't last as a crack. It's not viable. There is an N a Northern Ireland Dental Facebook page. It seems there are a lot going to turn their backs on NHS dentistry. Maybe that's the department's plan here. Maybe we should just all close the doors and refuse to work until they treat us with the respect the profession deserves. I'm tempted at this point. It may be the only way they will listen if we all down tools. The problem is everyone is too afraid to do that. We'll all just struggle on until we either succumb to the stress or become bankrupt. I'm not too far from either at the minute, and I'm sure I speak for a lot of the profession when they say that. In closing, members will know that the dental profession has been left to fight for its very survival over the past months. Our challenge to the department is to take the necessary steps to prioritize dentistry in the rebuild. Do not remove funding at this time of need. Include us as willing partners as we seek to collaborate in turning adversary, adversity into an opportunity to improve oral health. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, and we're going now, I think, to Paula for a presentation. Paula? Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting to represent the British Association of Private Dentistry in Northern Ireland and to highlight some salient issues in private dentistry since coronavirus restrictions were introduced. I'm Paula McHenry. I'm a specialist uh, oral surgeon and director of a private specialist dental clinic in Newry. We deliver secondary care for patients who are referred from general dentists for various specialist dental procedures. And if I can just highlight that the aims and objectives of both myself and my colleagues in the DDA are similar. We're all trying to get our dental practices 
reopened and provide the care to our patients in a safe environment. Um, the mission of the BDA uh, is to represent members of the private dental sector across the UK. And my personal impression was that this group was founded in the height of the frustration during COVID-19 when private, private dentists felt that they didn't have adequate presentation or felt that they weren't being listened to as an individual group. So I thank Richard for all of the, the, the extent of detail that he has provided to date. And I'll be speaking more from a personal point of view on behalf of the BDPA and how that uh, we have been surviving, surviving through COVID-19. So <clears throat> I have summarised into five points how COVID-19 affected the private component of dentistry and the impact on patients and dentists during the last 13 weeks. On the 28th of March, coronavirus restrictions were put in place, but the Department for the Economy identified dentists amongst those who were allowed to continue to work. However, the Department of Health severely limited the extent of treatment that was allowed to be completed by dentists and sub subsequently provided a financial package to compensate for this. This was only provided for the NHS component of dentistry. No package was offered for the private component. Many predominantly private dentists offered their services voluntarily and have continued to work in the NHS urgent dental care centres throughout the pandemic. And I, I know Richard has expanded on that previously. I initially wrote to the Department for the Economy stressing the lack of support for private dentistry, but no financial assistance was forthcoming. Many dentists provide both NHS and private care in varying proportions, but all agree that the provision of NHS care is subsidised by the private sector. In these mixed practices, the NHS patients that are being treated are often the most vulnerable in society, including the elderly, children and non-paying patients. Oral cancer screening is completed as part of all routine examinations. I understand many of these mixed NHS private practices, especially those with a significant proportion of private patients, have used their savings and extended loans to full capacity at this stage. Failure to support private dentistry will and has left these practices in a financially unstable state, which may inadvertently affect the provision of care to our most vulnerable groups. Pre-COVID-19, many private patients travel from the Republic of Ireland for treatment by dentists in the north, an obvious, an obvious boost to our economy as they often travel with families for shopping and relaxation at the same time. The Republic of Ireland reopened dental services on the 18th of May. They continued to carry out a full range of treatment since. Many of our patients from the north have felt the need to travel to the Republic of Ireland to receive adequate treatment. They have not been impressed with the provision of dental services in the north or lack of it due to continued restrictions. In addition, a significant proportion of our patients from the Republic of Ireland has ceased coming for treatment due to the restrictions, a double hit for our practices. These restrictions are set to continue till the 20th of July, a full 10 weeks since the dental practices reopened in the Republic of Ireland. To rebuild the relationship and confidence with patients to pre-COVID levels will take an even substantially longer period of time. Private specialty secondary care plays a significant role in contributing to the reduction of NHS hospital waiting lists inadvertently. Many NHS patients are referred by their dentists to private specialist clinics for treatment, especially for oral surgery procedures root fillings, gum treatment and oral lesions that may be pre-cancerous since hospital waiting lists are so long. Failure to support the provision of this specialist care in private clinics will ultimately result in hospital waiting lists growing or continuing to grow. The hospitals were already struggling to provide these services pre-COVID-19, especially oral surgery and other dental specialties. 
I would emphasise again that support is essential for private dentistry in both primary and secondary care settings to avoid the loss of practices to bankruptcy and further overload and in an already exhaustive system. The recovery period to reinstate dental practices will be extensive and is only due to start on the 20th of July at the earliest. More than three months since dentists have been permitted to provide any dental service. There is uncertainty about the support the practices will receive. Compliance with updated guidelines, including the acquisition of PPE, increased staff costs, increased treatment times for a reduced number of patients, have resulted in high stress levels amongst the dental community, particularly private dentists who have, had, who have received little or no funding and are anxious about the unpredictable extended recovery period that it may take to try and rebuild their practice. That has arisen through the extended lack of services due to, due to COVID restrictions. Some have received the £10,000 grant from the Department for the Economy, but many have not been eligible, including myself, and have not received any support other than the furlough scheme. This again has caused further distress by the inequality and unpredictability of the distribution of funding within the same sector. If private dentistry is to survive in Northern Ireland and positively contribute to the care of our patients from all sectors, it will need additional funding. Finally, COVID-19 has highlighted weaknesses within the system that require clarification to reduce the dismay that has resulted from ambiguity in the leadership in private dentistry. Despite several attempts to gain insight from the Department of Health about who is responsible for directing private dentistry, uncertainty still prevails. We as dentists are primarily clinicians. We have suffered along with our patients during the last 13 weeks. We are keen to provide the service that we are qualified to do to the best of our ability within a safe and risk-free environment. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for that, Paula. And my apologies to Richard, actually, who did the first presentation rather than Tristan, as I indicated. Um, so uh, thank you, panel, for that. Uh, two quick questions from me, and then I'm going to go to members. First of all, I was, I was quite concerned to hear from Richard's presentation that the issue of maternity pay has not been addressed. And, and you will be aware that I actually had been... Uh, involved back, I, I had engaged with the department around that issue, and there seemed to be a recognition that it was a serious issue. We should not be tolerating a situation where women are being uh, unjustifiably discriminated against, either directly or indirectly. And um, I'm concerned to hear that that issue is not resolved. But can I ask, you, is there a process ongoing, or where does it sit at the minute in terms of being addressed, Richard? Um, the the issue is the fact that when you take the reference period, if somebody has been in maternity leave when they come back from maternity uh, into the workplace, um, it takes quite a few months before your earning levels come back up again. It's, it's to do with the way that dentists are paid and that we're paid on completed treatments. So you're not actually paid as you go along. You have to do work and then you're, you're, you're completed for that work or pay for that work further down the line. So for the first month, you actually get nothing at all because you haven't completed any treatments for the previous month. The second month, the only treatments you're doing are very small value treatments, mostly like examinations, uh, things like that, which are completed. And it's really into the third, fourth month before you complete any courses of treatment and your earning level goes back up to what it would have been before you went on maternity leave. Yeah. So what happens at the minute with the way they've done the reference period, they take out the lowest month of earnings. But our point has been that you need to really look at the, the first two to three months and take those out because they're still uh, reducing the, the thing. Or even go back to the period, the you know, pre-maternity, and, and look at the, the levels at, at that stage. So is there an engagement ongoing with the, with the department around that issue? Um, Chair, Chair, yeah, I'd like yes, to answer that. Yeah. Um, 
I think the I think the issue with this scheme is that there's no appeals process because it was put together very quickly. Um, we did a trawl and found that there were 26 ladies who had been impacted and no, there has been no resolution and they have nowhere to take their concerns to. Um, they have written to the department and the response has pretty much been, you're lucky that you have received any payment at all. Um, but, and it doesn't matter that it's not an accurate reflection of what the earnings they would have received had they not been off maternity leave. So I guess that's why we wanted to raise it today to the committee, because there is nowhere else to take this issue. And while some additional payments have been made to a small number of these ladies, the majority have, have had no resolution and there's no um, offer on the part of the department to, to really resolve this satisfactorily. OK, um, OK. Well... We will move on for now. Um, in relation to, you have mentioned there, the, or Richard certainly mentioned, the potential for a radical rethink of dental services. You have referenced the fact of the very, very poor oral health outcomes that we have currently, and the fact that, that we don't have an oral health strategy. And we have actually heard in committee that there is no plans, or are no plans in place, to bring forward a new strategy. Now, oral health inequalities are, are also a huge issue across the North. So what suggestion would you have that the Department, in light of rebuilding services now, what measures could be introduced immediately to start to address better those oral health inequalities? Chair, if it's OK for me to answer, Caroline Lappin. Yes, Caroline, um, go ahead. Thank you. I think if you remember, and we, we sat across the table from you back in October, we, we, we stressed our concern around the lack of an oral health strategy that, that was indeed out of date. And at that time, the department had then offered to us um, that we would put together two oral health focus groups. Unfortunately, pre-COVID, those groups never actually got their terms of reference or got a chance to meet. In fact, dates were actually cancelled for that meeting to take place. So we, we entered COVID really in, 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 a, in the position that we didn't want to be, uh, where the initial promise of, of perhaps looking at oral health for the elderly and children uh, would have started. That doesn't happen, and COVID has only uh, succeeded in, in widening those oral health inequalities. I, I, I have been involved most days in working in one of the urgent care centres within one of the trust areas, uh, and we can see day on daily the, 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 the impact of a lack of access to dental care is having to people and those are only the ones who are in the worst state of dental pain and really really need to access something at that point in time when we look at the oral health the, the main or, or groups of, of, of vulnerable people th th this is a perfect opportunity to re to for the department to rethink what their stance has been around this or around the oral health strategy for northern ireland there is no doubt in my, in my mind, as working within a community dental service, that the oral health of the vulnerable groups of people that we tend to see, which are the elderly in care homes, those with learning disabilities, those with complex medical histories, that their oral health inequalities have only increased and indeed are continuing to increase because so many of these people are still shielding or are not out in society. In terms of the children and their general anaesthetic weights, we have just seen these increase exponentially. They, they were pretty bad pre-COVID. Now, with the, the difficulties in accessing general anaesthetic lists in hospitals throughout Northern Ireland, again, these are just increasing. So this is a perfect time to rebuild our service, but rebuild it differently. Like so many health services, we can't go back to what we were pre-COVID. This is the time to, to, for the department to really engage with the profession and look at how we can, as Richard did say, approach this not from a point of view of disease or failure, but approach this from a promotion-based uh, outcomes to try and focus on, on, on improving those oral health inequalities. And that could be done straight away. There are so many people within the profession who are keen for us to take that stance. And we will do everything we can as a profession to work with that. Thank you. Caroline, going across to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Um Paul and Richard for your presentation. Just to declare an interest, sure, uh, I have a sister who's a dentist. Um, in regards to um, patients being able to get access to appropriate level of NHS dental care um, imminently, how confident would the panel be that that's 
uh, that would be the case given the pressures with PP requirements, decontamination schedules uh, and other things for, for um, uh, NHS uh, dental practices. Uh, and I think Paula said there was no financial assistance, or she indicated certainly there was no financial assistance. Uh, how, how confident would the panel be um, that there's a plan in place from the department to support um, NHS dental care, including financial assistance where appropriate? Um, and just finally, uh, we have, I certainly have, I think other members might have had some correspondence from some students um, who are concerned that they uh, might have to pay for uh, scheduled uh, appointments that have been rearranged or cancelled because of COVID-19. Does the panel have any concerns or any opinions or have they heard any issues around that? Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, back to our panel, please. Uh, Richard here. Um, I, I'll answer the bit in the, on, on the NHS. Uh, I mean, the, routine, the return of routine dental care in England has seen a majority of practices operating at less than a quarter of their former capacity, uh, and that's to ensure social distancing and infection control protocols are, are met. Um, practices not only have that, but they have massive shortages and massive increases in costs for PPE. and. You know, we can put out the welcome mat, but w without access to either government supply chains or um, help with PPE, it's just not going to happen. Um, so we need long-term support put in place as well to support these sky-high overheads. I mean, it, there has been just a normal PPE, there's been a 1,299% increase in normal PPE costs. And I think all those people who donated their PP at the start of this at, at normal cost and having to replace it at these inflated costs are filling the pinch. Also, people are having to pay for uh, fit testing. I don't know if the panel uh, knows about the, the fit testing of masks and things like that. So if you have a, a practice and you have to get all your practice fit tested for those masks, it can cost anything from five to six hundred pounds. And it's only a fit testing for that mask alone. In fact, if you then can't get supplies of that mask and have to get another mask instead, then you have to pay to get everybody fit tested again. So, I mean, we don't know what support is going to be given to us. It's almost too late because people are already incurring these costs because as we, we know we're, it's Monday, <coughs> the 29th of June is, is, is a Monday and people who want to start on the 1st of July have already gone out and got fit testing done and got all the masks and got all the PPE on the strength of the government saying that they will help but we don't know what form that help's going to take yet. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Going across then to Paula. Um, thank you. Thank you, panel, for coming along today. Um, some of the questions I was going to ask have already um, been answered. But um, the, is it true that the, the guidance that's come forward from the department in terms of the gap in time between patients is 60 minutes for drilling, and that that sort of recommendation or um, provision is, is more restrictive than other parts of the world, and certainly in terms of the South? And also the issue around um, women who are on maternity um, post-birth in terms of that they will have missed out on um, dental appointments because the dental surgeries are, are, are down. And, and how do we make up for the time that they could possibly be receiving vital treatment um, um, uh, before their year is up? Does that make sense? I'm happy, Paula, to, to take the first part of, of your question. Um, Caroline here. Uh, in terms of the, the downtime that you talk about, that's what's called the fallow time, which is the time that a dental surgery needs to be left empty um, to allow the aerosol particles in the room to settle. Now, the guidance that we have here in Northern Ireland um, is saying that after an aerosol generating procedure in a dental surgery that doesn't have something called negative pressure or doesn't have any significant amount of changes of air in an hour long period, then yes, we do have to leave that surgery 60 minutes. So that means from the minute that the, 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 the drill or the um, uh, syringe that, that produces air and water from you, you have used that, then that surgery must be left empty for 60 minutes. 
once that 60 minutes is up, then the staff, you, NPPE, can go in and decontaminate infection control and clean that room. So that has a significant impact. We've been seeing this in the urgent dental care centres. It's limiting the number of patients we can see in a day. But, but probably the huge impact of that is for my colleagues who are in their general dental practice. It does differ in terms of the amount of air changes that can be achieved through ventilation systems. Um, in all honesty, the 60 minutes appears to be a, an arbitrary figure that, 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 that is being used. It's used extensively. Um, like so many things in relation to COVID, the evidence for 60 minutes is not there. Um, if you're, for instance, working in a, in a theatre environment in a hospital where you have got up to 25 air changes in a room in an hour, then that time can go down significantly. But the vast majority of dental practices in Northern Ireland here are in buildings that don't have sophisticated ventilation systems. It's never been something that's been obviously an issue before. So that downtime in itself is a massive impact on people trying to run practices, trying to provide care for their patients, and ultimately trying to run their business as well. So that, 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 that is a, a, a big factor at the minute. Thank you. Um, I'm going There's to go... A second question go ahead, in yeah. relation to treatment for women um, post-pregnancy, that their, their year of free treatment, and what can be done to support them? Um, I'll, I'll answer that. Unfortunately, there's absolutely nothing that we as dentists can do about that because there are, we work to, to a thing called the Statement of Dental Remuneration and we, we work to terms and conditions of service that we have no control over. So that question would really have to be asked of the Department of Health. But our, the date your treatment starts, the date you come into the surgery, is the date that your course of treatment starts, and I have no ability to backdate that. In fact, if I backdated it, I would definitely get a visit from the property officers. So we, we don't have any power over that, Paul, I'm afraid. Sorry, Paul. Can you identify, sorry, is that Richard or Tristan? That was Richard, sorry. Richard, thank you. Can, okay. I, can I come back in that? I'm just conscious that there'll be a backlog of clients across a, a number of sectors. Is there any um, moves for the dentist to maybe prioritise those women to get them in, to even if they have their treatment started, even if it's not completed within the year? Is that something that is within the, get the dentist's gift? The, now, we have been given guidance on, it's Richard again, sorry, we have been given the guidance on uh, prioritising patients okay. and who should be seen first and whatnot. Now, I don't think, I, I think they were looking more at health problems and things like that. I don't think that, you know, the ability of somebody <laughs> to pay or the, the fact that somebody would have got free treatment was seen by the department as a priority. I could be wrong on that. I have read guidance, and I just don't remember seeing that follow up. But uh, um, I don't know, Tristan, do you remember? No, I haven't seen anything. No, I haven't seen anything either. Sorry. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm going to go to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then I'm going to go to Orlea on the phone, just to give you a bit of notice, Orlea. So, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your presentation. Um, a lot of very serious issues that you've raised there. Um, in, in terms of, have you, can you give me any, any indication of uh, indicative costs per practice of putting in place a social distancing infrastructure and securing PPE? Uh, that would be uh, the first part of my question. And, and um, on the back of that as well, have you been given any indication whatsoever from the Department of Health of consideration of additional financial support post July? Um, it's Richard here again. Thank it you, seems I'm, I'm seem to be answered to <laughs> quite a few of this stuff. I, I've spent an awful lot of my last uh, period of my life talking about PPE, something I never thought I'd be majoring in. But um, the BDA has done a lot of work on this. And if you just look at the cost of PPE alone, ignoring all the other treatment costs, so for treating a single patient, it has increased by up to 6,000%. And you heard that right, 6,000%. So the cost for the kit that we needed pre-COVID was about 35 to 40 pence per patient. And it can now stand at around 20 to 30 pounds, depending on what exact PPU requirements you have and, and the usage. For example, you need, you need a, a higher PPE for doing uh, aerosol generating procedures. 
So one uh, Northern Ireland member has calculated a practice with three surgeries could require 12 FFP3 masks per day at a cost of £10 per mask, which equates to £120 to, per day, something we never had to do beforehand. Another Northern Ireland member has calculated the cost of PPE per treatment has risen for them 1,299% uh, between August 2019 and June 2020. So if you're just doing an ordinary occlusal filling, which is just a small single surface filling in a back tooth, it now costs £11.29 to perform this due to the increase in PPE costs. However, we're only paid £9.39 to carry it out. So if we go back to the, the model we had pre-COVID, practices will just go out of business. Okay, and could I just add to that, Richard? It's Paula here. Paula, I think you know, there's a bit of feedback on your line, maybe. I'm not sure if there's anything you can... Have you a phone close to you or anything like that? I have got a phone, yeah. Yeah, that's better now there, but I think that's better now. Go ahead, Paula. That's better, yeah? Yes, it is. It is. Um, you know, we, I have been in private practice and um, all of the references to the cost of PPE, the references to the fit testing for the different masks, and have are and have been incurred by private dentists in their clinics and will be in mixed practices as well and so therein lies the problem that in the masks that i bought initially some of them are costing 13 pounds 50 each then you get your fit testing in that's 600 pounds per session and then that mask runs out of supply you have to start it all over again and the next time you go to order it you don't know what you're going to have to be paying for it. Um, so there's huge uncertainty about the costs going forward and they affect private dentistry in exactly the same way as NHS dentistry. So I just want to highlight that point. Thank you. Uh, it's Richard here as well. Who is I mean, that, sorry? Paula, Paula uh, has been talking about... It's Richard, yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, Paula has been talking about private dentists, but I mean, we're talking about mixed practice here. Uh, according to the Health and Social Care Board statistics, there are around 100,000 patients who are registered to dentists with less than a 50% health service commitment. So we're, we're talking about you know, still health service committed practices here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's um, quite horrific. Um, but um, just to move on to the next question, and that's uh, someone had mentioned there's. Is there a 10-week difference between um, the UK and um, the Republic of Ireland in terms of reopening dentists? Is that right? Yes, that's Paula here, yeah. Okay, and um, I suppose what, what is your opinion on that? I mean, it's always struck me that dentists are healthcare professionals and highly trained uh, and, is, and also very well trained in terms of use of PPE and that. Do, do you think... Uh, do you think the government has been overly cautious in allowing you to, to continue your work, or have you an opinion on that? Um, it, what I would say is that... That's Paula, just for clarity. It, it, yeah. it's, it's Paula here, yes, thank yeah. You, Paula. It, it is um, enlightening to see how the dentists in the south, um, which are only a few miles away from me, have been able to get up and running with limited PPE and much more relaxed regulations. I do understand the Department of Health in the position that they are, that they have to, you know, look at any possible risk um, to patients in terms of aerosols and whatnot. But there is conflicting evidence and lack of evidence with regard to the actual risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 from a dental aerosol. And there are many um, sections of research done throughout the world at this stage um, to say that actually the risk is minimum. So I suppose in some ways we feel frustrated because our patients have gone over the border into the south to get treated. Our patients from the south are no longer coming up. And I, they probably think that it's a ridiculous situation that within five miles of the same country that um, the treatment protocols are the exact opposite or very different. Okay, Chair, just, I mean, that's, um, that's very interesting to hear that, uh, 
Paula, and I suppose my concern would be as uh, as an all of our health service that whilst you know we're all doing the right thing in terms of fighting COVID-19, that we we are risking missing lots of other serious diseases and cancers um, and causing misery. It, you know, at the same time, and obviously those type of restrictions on your uh, business and on, on this uh, dental health care could have really, really bad impacts for the public in general. So I would be very concerned about it, but uh, it's very interesting to hear uh, your view on that. So thank you. Can, can I just add one, uh, one additional comment? Yeah. Um, the fit testing element of wearing PPE, um, I looked at a piece of research that was done recently on other countries throughout the world that actually carry out fit testing. The UK is the only country in the entire world that is doing this, apart from one small section of Canada. No other dental section anywhere in the world is saying you have to fit test. So there's what I mean by evidence and, and the lack of clarity. You know, is it evidence supported or is it assumption? Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm going to go to Arlea on the phone then. If are you there, yes. Arlea? Uh, yeah. I am. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose just given all the concerns of the panel um, and some of the members have already spoke about, um, I'm conscious that the Chief Dentistry Officer um, hasn't been included, um, to my knowledge, anyway, in the Department's new Management Board. Um, so if I could ask the panel, what consequences do you think um, this might have for addressing the challenges that your profession is facing? And my second question would be around, Paula already touched on it with some of the speakers around the, the absence of routine care in the past 13 weeks and the gap between appointments. What overall impact do you think this is going to have on your profession, your workload, and more importantly, the wait list? And the time ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. Here. Yeah, Richard. Thank you. Um, the, I mean, I, I said in my my statement at the start, it, it's really important that the acting CDO is on the HSC management board going forward. This happens us all the time in dentistry. Uh, I mean, we're we're told by the Department of Health when we need a dental input, we will ask for it. If they don't have dental input, they don't know they need it. It has happened time after time after time. And it's really important going forward that the acting CDO is on the Health and Social Care Management Board. Um, in the second question about the, the effect this is having on the profession, uh, or I mean, I, I read you out the email uh, from a, a young uh, female colleague, and I think it, it showed the frustration and the stress that the profession is going through at the minute, um, and the uncertainty. Um, and it, it's going to get worse unless we get certainty from the Department of Health over PPE, over ongoing financial support, because we can't go back to the, the way we were before uh, in, in the short term. So there's the, the support is needed there. Um, and I just worry that I, I read you out one email. Believe me, I receive emails, texts, and phone calls from dentists daily who are all feeling exactly the same way. And they're terribly worried about their future. They're terribly worried about their patients. They're terribly worried about their businesses. Um, and it, it's a worrying situation for me. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Chair, it's, it's Caroline here. If it's all right to interject. Yes, Caroline, go um, ahead. Just, just in terms of the, the, the exclusion of the acting chief dental officer in the new management board that's being established, that, that is hopefully an oversight, and we certainly within the BDA have made our, our uh, have written to the, to the Department of Health to ensure that the acting CDO is included in that management board. You know, Pre-COVID, we spent a huge amount of time talking about rethinking our services, rebuilding, redesigning our services, trying to do things transformatively. 
you know, we had an event in October we talked to you about quite oral health matters. Oral health matters in so many aspects of general health care. We even just even look at our vulnerable groups of elderly people and the impact that oral health can have on the incidence of pneumonias and, and other, other comorbidities. It's vital that our acting CDO has a voice at that management board about re-establishing health care in Northern Ireland. Oral health is part of the overall health care picture and we cannot accept that being left out of that is in the interest of our patients. Thank you, Caroline. Are you okay, Orlea, with that? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Connell. Okay, thank you. I'm going across to Pat here now. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the panel for their presentations today. I've been speaking to a number of dentists over the past few weeks, and uh, concerns have been expressed to me that whilst many dentists who are employed uh, have been furloughed during this pandemic, but practice owners have received very little help, and there's concern that uh, many of them may actually go bust. Uh, allied to that, uh, we have uh, very poor oral health, especially among our children. Our, our children are said to have the worst oral health uh, on these islands, and the health inequalities, particularly in the constituency I represent in West Belfast, are particularly bad. And as well as that, we have the lack of, a, of an updated oral health strategy. So my question for you is, uh, do you believe or are you confident the Chief Dental Officer is providing the necessary leadership at this time? Thank you. Over to our panel, please. OK, well, Richard here. Thank um, you. The thing about practices going bust, that's a real possibility. Um, Especially the more privately orientated your practice is. Um, Go ahead, Richard. There was a bit of feedback coming through there, but I think we can hear you okay. Sorry. About 75% of dental practices with low or no NHS commitment said they would face him in difficulties in the next three months. Those three months have now passed. Um, they, if they don't get help or with the PPE going forward, then there will be practices go bust. I'm, I'm worried about other things as well. I mean, dentistry is a very stressful career. Um, and I qualified in 1984, and there were 30 people in my year. Two of them committed suicide, unfortunately. And at one of the funerals, I, I promised his widow that I would do everything in my power to make sure that we didn't have to go to another one of those funerals. And I just worry that that's where we're headed. Uh, the oral health strategy, I might hand over to Caroline on that. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, chair and panel, in, in terms of the situation that we find ourselves in dentistry with our, our acting chief dental officer, um, the, the, the BDA have engaged extensively with our acting chief dental officer, who is also head of dental services in the Health and Social Care Board. You asked about confidence. Well, I think time will tell. As, uh, as things go on, we, we, we do acknowledge that our, our acting chief dental officer is in, engaging with us as a professional body for dentists. He does seem to understand a lot of the issues that we're under, but understanding and acting on those are, are, are very difficult asks. We do appreciate that he is, is a voice in a wider healthcare system, but, but, but we need the wider healthcare system, including the chief dental officer and your, the support of yourselves as a health committee, to ensure that that voice of dentistry is there that the oral health inequalities that, that Pat referred to are, 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 are noticed and are taken on board. It, it is a disgrace, the oral health inequalities that still exist in 2020 in Northern Ireland. Um, I think we have to have confidence in, in, in our Chief Dental Officer, and we certainly as a profession want to have that confidence, but that confidence w w will come with being able to see action to support us to do our jobs, to run our practices, and to ultimately take care of our patients and, and try to ensure that the preventive message is, is supported because that's the only way forward here. As Richard said in his opening remarks, we cannot continue to count widgets. This is clearly not working. We have an outdated system of remuneration for general dental practice. We do need to look at things difficultly, and as a profession, we will be relying on our acting chief dental officer to help us as a profession do that. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Pat. Um, just one final question from me, panel, in relation to the provision of dental uh, services into care homes at the minute for, for elderly people in care home settings. Have you any suggestions as to how that could be managed um, and improved, indeed? I'm happy, panel, if you want me to answer that. Um, Who's that, sorry? Caroline Lappin here. Caroline, again. Thank you. Um, so I, I work within the community dental service, who by, by default at the minute provide a, a lot of the, the, the services within the care home environment. Um, as you will be aware, access to, to patients in the care home environment um, ha, has virtually been non existent since, since, since the COVID pandemic has started. Um, within my own trust, Recently, what we are trying to do is um, we've been phoning every single care home within our trust area to let the managers and the staff know that we are there for them. We are there to support our patients who are there. Accessing these patients is going to be key. But again, it brings us back to the rethinking of how we do things. You know, we are one service that goes into care home alongside so many other services. You know, re-looking at how we work together, re-looking at how our professionals can work together is going to be key to accessing homes, care homes rather, and reducing you know, unnecessary footfall. But perhaps dentistry, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, all being able to work together. But that won't happen unless our acting chief dental officer has a seat at that management board to re-establish services. You know, that's just one example of, of, of how that vulnerable group of people in care homes uh, c can benefit from that. Um, as a profession, we're very worried about these patients because there has been a huge amount of work has been going on uh, at local levels, within trusts, and within general, general dental practitioners who have an interest in helping to look after these patients. We are very concerned that naturally, given the pressure care home staff have been under, that the, the, the oral health work that we had put in and put desperately into these, these services um, may have fallen by the wayside. And the longer that we, don't, we, we are not able to access these patients, then the harder that's going to be to try and improve these things again so that those vulnerable groups the elderly in care homes and their learning disabled patients who aren't able to access services they are a worry to us as a profession yet again if we had an oral health strategy to underpin all of this that gives us a reference document that gives us something that we that we, we, can, we can put meat on the bones with that unfortunately in the position we are in you know we're, we're lacking that we're lacking that strategy okay. and just it's richard here chair just yes, uh, and the, there is money in the dental budget. I mean, last year there was a 6.8 million underspend in the dental budget, and in the last five years there's been a 19.1 million underspend in the dental budget. In a service that's in crisis, this is ridiculous. I mean, surely somebody must be able to get the money from A to B. And in the same five years, there were an extra 55,000 patients registered. So we're doing a lot more work for a lot less money. Surely there's some way of doing this better. Okay, thank you, and thank you to the panel for for once again appraising us of the of the serious issues and concerns within dentistry. Um, I want to wish you and all your membership all the best in the time ahead in terms of trying to rebuild those services and to deal with those backlogs that have undoubtedly built up, and also in relation to the the to supporting the need for uh, a very targeted a uh, oral health strategy that will address some of the inequalities and some of the some of the poor outcomes that we experience right across the piece but in terms of the uh, the health the oral health inequalities also so um thank you and i wish you all the best we we thank you for coming to the panel today all the best thank, thank, you, you, for thank you thank you thank you Okay, members. Any? I'm just wondering how to take this stuff forward. You know, are we going to invite the chief, uh, interim chief dental officer here? Are we going to write and raise concerns? Because there are some really fundamental issues there that I think we need to represent to the department on their behalf. Yeah, um, or Liam, just checking with you on the phone there. If you've, are you still with us there? I am. Yes. Yep. Yeah, good. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a, a question of whether or not there was a number of issues. According to me, that the, the maternity one is still clearly not resolved. Um, maybe the maybe the what do members think? Maybe this, inviting the interim CDO would be the best way to ad address them directly, rather than just an exchange of. Um, but I suppose in, in terms of in terms of timing, it's just a question. of... Yes, Claire, could you? Well, if we are not going to have the proposed meeting on the Monday, the sixth of July. We could revert to our normal slot on the Thursday, the 9th, 
and that you would have space that day then if we're not having that expert panel? Because I think there is a bit of an urgency to, to all of this. You know, these, these are key services. We have fallen badly behind as a result of, of the COVID-19, and I think there is a bit of an urgency on that. Would members be content to agree that we, we seek to set that engagement up? Sure, um, so I would be very content to um, agree with that proposal from Paula. Um, I think um, I'm quite horrified by what we've heard here today. Re really, I mean, worried for the kind of the industry in itself even in terms of the economy, but for the wider health implications, I think that this is really serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, members content with that, that we agreed that we will we'll seek a meeting with the, or a presentation from the Interim Chief Dental Officer. Okay, thank you, members. I am then going to move on to our correspondence. So, turning to correspondence, I refer members to uh, uh, tab 10 of the pack and to the correspondence and your table papers and the correspondence memo at tab 10.1. So I'd just like to draw your attention to a number of items within that correspondence, members. Item 10.2 is a departmental response to the committee's request for information on nerve tags, recommendations regarding PPE. Um, and I am conscious that the, the Minister and CMO are coming on Tuesday, but is there any other comments or are, men, are members content to note uh, awaiting further engagement or whatever with, with the Minister? Members happy to note? Yeah? Thank you. Item 10.3 then is a departmental response to the committee's request for information regarding the impact of COVID-19 on services and treatments for multiple sclerosis patients. Um, any comment in relation to that from members? Or members content to note that item? Members content to note? Thank you. Um, moving on then to item 10.4 is the, mem the Minister's response to a number of issues raised after the meeting on the 20th of May. Um, are members content to note or any comments in relation? Okay. Content on the phone. Item 10.6 is a response from the Minister to our correspondence recommending direct representation for allied health professionals on the new management board. The Minister indicates that he is content that AHPs are represented by the Chief Nursing Officer. Um, now, that is an issue that I certainly would intend to raise with the Minister on Tuesday, I have to say, but are members content to note the response pending the discussion, or are there, are there things that members want to discuss in relation to that item now? No, well, I, I totally agree. I think it needs, we can't let that go. Same for the um, dental officer, because yeah. when they are talking about, for example, the care homes, the in-reach um, clinical response, a lot of that will fall on our L L health professionals. So there are issues there around workforce and capabilities and training and stuff. So I think they are going to be fundamental to this resetting and rebuilding of the health service. Yeah. So I can't believe they're not there. Yeah, and I think I think that that point was made quite strongly in the last presentation as well, where where, you know, if you only seek input from dentist or from OT or from whoever when you think you need it, how do you know what it is you don't know? So I think it's better to have a broader, a broader representation. So I think that will certainly be a focus. Um, are members content that we we raise it then and, and then see where that situation is? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Item 10.9 is correspondence from an individual regarding coronavirus-related guidance for those with diabetes in the workplace. Are members content to note that item? Chair, I, um, I have written to uh, the department to ask to raise some of these issues, and I suppose we've all received that sort of correspondence from um, people who are living with diabetes and stuff, so I think it's maybe something that we need to keep a, a watch on. And the committee has written to the department in relation to that as well, so I do think we, we will receive correspondence in due course. Okay, okay item 10.11 is correspondence from Irish Advocacy Network outlining the services it offers to HSC providers. Are members content to note, or do they have comments in relation to that item? No. Thank you. Content to note. Item 10.13 is a report from the NI Union of Supported Employment, supplying a report and asking to brief the committee. Um, and I suppose when I saw that one, I was, I was very conscious. And I know some of some of the members uh, of our committee and some who are still here attended the the meeting in relation to the. Uh, the learning disability and, and some of the very many issues that people across a range of disabilities are experiencing. And I was just wondering, in light of that, should we consider looking at a wider look at disability later on in the year, maybe, to, to bring some of those groups together as a, as a dedicated session, maybe, and, and look at how things are going at that point and how things would need to be improved or what issues? Would members be content with that approach? 
I wouldn't say later in the year, I think as soon as we can get, get it in, obviously we're heading into recess, but I do think that they've been very badly affected in the lockdown and obviously the schools reopening special needs and stuff, I think there's certainly a lot of issues there we could be exploring. Yep. Okay. So members are agreed that that we invite NIUSE and other other relevant stakeholders to address a panel here. Okay. Absolutely. Members can Thank you. Item ten point one five is from. Uh, sorry, Orlea, You just indicate there if you if there's anything you want to come in on at all, rather than me having to take tack back and forward, please. Yeah, I will do. Thanks. Uh, item ten point one five is from the committee for the economy. Informing us of the House of Lords International Agreements Subcommittee's inquiry into UK US trade negotiations, which will include healthcare and drug pricing within its initial focus. Um, are members content to note that pending further consideration of Brexit and health, which no doubt will come across our, our desk uh, in, uh, on an ongoing basis? Item 10.7 then is letter on visiting rights in antenatal and maternity settings, which has been forwarded by Alan. Um, hugely significant issue and has already been raised here today, I think rightly so. Um, very important health and wellbeing aspects, um, as mentioned, bonding and attachment and involvement in, in the whole process and, and the wonderful experience that, that people are missing out on as well, as well as dealing with difficulties uh, in, in relation to, to uh, pregnancy. But could I propose we write and ask the department to give this, this serious consideration? Have we have we already included that in our earlier in our so that's already been been factored into our earlier um, agreement? Okay. So item ten point two zero is a copy of correspondence from the committee for education to the minister of health regarding the mental health action plan. Uh, are members content to note that, or do they wish to make any comment in relation to that item? Okay. Members content to note. Thank you. And then, in terms of remaining items, are members otherwise content with the actions as noted in the main correspondence memo? Yeah. Members content. Yeah. And in, real, in relation to table correspondence, there is one item within that that I want to highlight is item 10.23 uh, from the Minister advising of the appointment of Professor Siobhan O'Neill as interim mental health champion. And I would just like to sincerely welcome uh, Siobhan O'Neill, Professor O'Neill's appointment to that role. It's a hugely important role, and I know that she is hugely well regarded within that within that sector. And uh, her her appointment has been broadly welcomed. But I would like to propose maybe the committee write to Professor O'Neill to congratulate her on her appointment and indicate that we look forward to engaging with her at some point in the future. And I think it's it's uh, definitely something that we would look forward to in the future. Absolutely. Members content with that? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Moving on then, members, to the Forward Work Programme. Item 1.1, can I refer members to the draft Forward Work Programme at tab 11 of the table pack? Are members content to note the Forward Work Programme uh, agreed? Or, sorry, are members content to note the Forward Work Programme? Are we agreed? Yeah, yeah agreed. Members, I now propose that we go into closed session to consider item 11.2 from the Chairperson's Liaison Group in table papers. So we will now suspend the meeting in public. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, 